Hey there, fellow nerds and geeks. Aaron Naboo's here, and thank you so much for tuning in to the Hall H Show podcast. What do Kurt Busick, the Eisner Awards, Jack Kirby, SDCC Fit, Tennis Balls, and Lolita's Taco Shop have in common? Our San Diego Comic Con 2017 recap, of course. What an epic event this year's SDCC was for the Hall H team. We've covered quite a few panels, especially ones pertaining to Jack Kirby, managed to record five podcasts, connected with both familiar and new artists, and we also found time to have some fun. I know I definitely got some SDCC fit in, dancing the night away at the Hero Within Red Wedding and the Screen Junkies after parties. Along with my co-host, Alex Benedicto, we are joined by Jason Lethert, Dan Barry, and Matt Dunford on this recap of SDCC 2017, which, if I were to give it a name, would be Rise of the Independent Creators. Enjoy! There, fellow nerds and geeks, Aaron Naboos here, and welcome to the Hall H Show podcast. On this episode, we are recapping our experiences at San Diego Comic Con 2017. Of course, with the show this big, I couldn't do it all by myself. So, we have, as always, my uh, partner in crime and co host, Alex Benedicto. We got uh, Jason Lethert, my sometimes partner in crime and uh, frequent guest, uh, Jason Lethert uh, from. Uh, HeroJournalism.com. We have uh, Mr. Dan Barry, the man that goes to over 200 cons a year. And then we have, last but not least, Uncle Dunphy himself, Matt Dunford. Uh, I current, think he's very on the least side here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the current chairman of uh, San Diego Comic Fest, who, who's no stranger to uh, Comic Con or San Diego Comic Con himself. I think it's 23 straight years. 23 straight years. That's right. So, everybody, thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for being on the show. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm happy to be back. <laughs> because, I mean, it's like, I mean, what's the old saying? If you're doing a geeky event in Southern California and Matt Dunford isn't there, then it's not worth going to. Because somehow <laughs> I find my way to get into everything and be everywhere at once. I mean, how do I do it? <laughs> Definitely a good sign you're at a fun spot if you see Dunford there. Yeah, it's like, I mean, you've even randomly, like, you know, shown up to, like, I'll go to this comedy show down the street. Oh, Matt Dunford's there. Okay. <laughs> well, you're not just in San Diego. No, no, Seattle I'm, once. Yeah, Seattle. It's like everybody gets a, everybody gets a piece of me. It's like I mean, I've like hit like events in San Francisco and back to San Diego in the same night. It's like I mean, I'm I'm crazy like that. <laughs> that is crazy. Yeah. All right. Uh, on this episode, we will recap what uh, each of us did at San Diego Comic Fest. We'll cover Comic-Con. panels. I'm sorry. <laughs> Comic Con. As, so, as much as I like the attention for Comic Fest, yeah, <laughs> I'm like staring at Matt right now. You know, I, I got I got Comic Fest in, in the head. So I'm the brain. <laughs> um, we will uh, talk about the panels that we went to, uh, exhibitors that we visited, uh, offside events, and uh, maybe some after hour uh, little mixers that we attended. Um, we'll also discuss our top five moments, and we'll also talk about any panels or events that we sort of regret missing. Uh, we'll talk about trends that we noticed, uh, what we think San Diego Comic Con can do to improve. Of course, we'll do a fun around, you know, our off the beaten path set of questions. We'll talk about a few artists that caught our eye in our Art Watch segment. And then we'll flash forward and talk about what's on the horizon for all of us. So I guess I will uh, start off with um, talking about some of the panels that I attended. Um, I attended a few um, that uh, Rob Sokowitz uh, moderated, and I wish I could have attended, you know, all of his panels. But obviously, you know, time <laughs> time is a, a commodity at uh, at, uh, at Comic Con. Um, I went to his Underground Comics uh, with uh, Dennis Kitchen and also went to his Pop Culture Shark Tank. Um, the Underground Comics panel with Dennis Kitchen was uh, interesting because I have no knowledge or really you know, explored the Underground Comics scene. Um, obviously, it's something that grew out of the hippie movement in the 60s, so I found that uh, panel pretty interesting, and I'll definitely uh, look up Dennis Kitchen a little bit more later. Um, his Pop Culture Shark Tank panel, uh, that was pretty interesting. Um, 
basically, um, you know, three entrepreneurs pitched their ideas to a panel, and um, uh, we took some video, and I'll be posting that shortly. Um, Tony Kim from Hero Within knocked it out of the park with his pitch. So that was a pretty cool panel. Uh, speaking of Tony Kim, I went to his Building a Geek Brand panel. That was pretty cool. Um, friend of the podcast, um, Steve from NerdFu was a panelist on there. Um, you had uh, was Chris Gore. Oh, yeah, Film film Threat. Yeah, and then uh, Anna Mia was on that panel as well, so that was, that was pretty cool. Um, obviously, this year we celebrated Jack Kirby's centennial, so I went to a couple of uh, Jack Kirby panels. Um, one... Of course, I went to was the one by uh, Arlen Schumer. Is oh, I big... attended as well. It was, he uh, knocked it out of the park once yeah, again. And yeah. He did that at San Diego Comic Fest. And so that was just like the introduction for him. But this one, you got to see the perfected version of it. So I thought it was, you know, very entertaining. I missed the first two minutes of it, but, you know, it caught the rest. So, and of course, it caught my eye. And uh, the thing is, you know, you didn't get to see it in its full, like, form because anyone who knows Arlen knows he talks a lot <laughs> and he can talk forever about the subject. And at Comic Fest, you know, he went a little over, got a little overtime, but, you know, and we let him, you know, so as long as the guests, the other following guests were cool with it. But, of course, here at San Diego Comic Con, they are very, very strict about that <laughs> hour. And, of course, and more importantly, they're strict about the 50 minutes because they have to take 10 minutes of prep to shoehorn in for the next one and make sure that everything transitions smoothly and, you know... So we only got to see 50 minutes of it and a little bit of uh, Arlen saying, give me more time, give me more time, give me more time. Like, and like, but, you know, he, he knows how to close it out at it. So that's something that marks a really good speaker is you should know how to do your panel, but if you don't have enough time to do everything, know how to put an end on it. Yeah. For anybody that's out there who goes to a con and Arlen Schumann has a panel, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Just Just go. <laughs> Um, he's really knowledgeable about Silver Age comics and, and the artwork that goes with, with those. Um, another panel that I went to was uh, Susan Botello's mobile filmmaking panel. Uh, I think that's going to be a, obviously a growing trend, making movies with your mobile devices. Mm -hmm. um, and an artist that we follow, he's from Baltimore. His name is Brian Tillman. He has an awesome panel on how to pitch and promote yourself. Um, he talked about, you know, I'm going to give away his five little steps here, but you know, even if I say them, you still got to go because the way he delivers is just, you know, I've, I've watched it maybe three years in a row now and I'm, st I'm still like, I'm still going to go every year. <laughs> Basically, uh, the gist of his how to pitch and promote yourself deals with five main points. It's to know your product, know how to bullshit your way to the truth, <laughs> network, um, be aware of the thin line between confidence and cockiness, and lastly, and probably most important, it's not about you. So... Those are his five tips on how to pitch and promote yourself. Um, for me, some of the exhibitors that I sort of, uh, you know, took time to sort of visit, um, obviously Hero Within, um, we're big supporters of what they're trying to do. Um, Dark Planet Comics, uh, it's Stefan Frank's um, comic book Silver, is uh, published by Dark Planet. So we made it a point to go visit them, and we actually did a, a like a podcast interview with them as well. And... Um, we went to Action Labs uh, to say hi to uh, um, Jason Inman and Ashley Victoria Robinson, whose comic book we featured uh, on a previous episode of the podcast, uh, their comic book called Jupiter Jet. It was finally nice to see it in print, so we talked to them for a little bit and, and got it signed. Um, Jason was also at, uh, at Hoopla. Um, I guess it's a sort of like a digital uh, online library of comic books, so... Um, I think that's going to be a growing trend, which we'll probably talk a little bit later. I saw Jason Inman uh, at Con too, and mm -hmm. it was funny because I'm like, where do I know that name from? That name's so familiar. And it was from Hall H. Ah. And, um, and it was funny because I was there to cover a different panel, mm -hmm. but I was worried about it, so I got there early. And the panel previous to it was DC All Access. Yeah. And, and so that's just so funny to hear you bring it up again. I actually meant to bring that up to you, that the Hall Age podcast <laughs> had introduced that guy to me. And I didn't know that I didn't make the connection because you would talk about the Jupiter Jet comic book. Mm -hmm. And I didn't make the connection to the DC All Access guy. That was very that, interesting. That's his 9 to 5, I guess. <laughs> So, and, the, and both Ashley and, and Jason have a podcast, a Geek History Lesson. It's an awesome podcast you should probably check out. Um, 
us, our friends at Stranger Comics. I always try to visit them whenever I'm at a, at a con because I, I love what they're trying to do. They're building their own fantasy world, and you know they're they're doing it by their own rules. So and they're they're uh, starting to grow, and it's it's really good to see. Um, the Society of Illustrators of Los Angeles. I mentioned Arlen Schumer earlier. I got a chance to talk to him at that booth uh, after his panel uh, for a few minutes. So I just want to give a shout out to them. Um, and um, Bobby Rubio, uh, booth 1943. He's always at that booth number. <laughs> That's the reason why I remember it. <laughs> uh, he was there with uh, Keith and Jones, and I think Bobby's brother was there too, right? Yeah. Ronald. Yeah. yeah. It was my first time meeting him this year, and you know, he's got a really great set of artwork, and mm -hmm. I gotta say, because I wasn't really too familiar with his work, but one of the uh, instructors at Little Fish Comic Book Studio turned me on to his work and introduced me to him, so I can say, like, wow, he's cool, and he's local, that's awesome. It's like, yeah, geez. Just when you think that you know everyone, there's someone else that, uh, you know, you get to know. It's like, then off, because I have to keep up with the whole, you know, reputation of like, wait, you know Matt Dunford? I'm Matt Dunford, I know everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, obviously, and there was some, you know, offsite events and after-hour events. Well, we'll get to a little bit later uh, when we get to, uh, well, I guess for myself, when we get to the top five moments. Um, I guess we'll go to uh, Dan next. Um, you want to talk about some of the things that you got into at Comic-Con? Um, well, I was there as press, so I, some of the things I did, I only went to one panel, which was the Stan Lee one, oh, that, um, Stan Lee, Adam Savage, Felicia Day, guy kind of talking about his um, career which is a cool panel, and from there I jetted off. I did um, round table interviews with the cast of Lucifer and with, which other round table was it? Another round table, which is escaping me right now. I did the press conference for Can the- Can I ask Dan, the Stan Lee thing, what did they, what did they cover in the Stan Lee thing? Did they, how far back in history did they go? Or did they, they focus on a lot on what he's doing now, or what do you? A little bit both. It was basically it was being moderated by one of the guys at Legion M. So it was basically just a Q and A type thing, talk about his career and how that went. I was only there maybe half an hour before I take off. Because I know that he's not, you know, he doesn't, you know, they don't. He doesn't really go into the history stuff too much, does he? I mean, for for example, at Comic Con, you know, that they they do they used to do Silver Age panels all the time or whatever, and. Uh, my understanding was uh, that he wasn't, you know, usually he doesn't like to look back too much on that stuff. He's told the stories a million times. Yeah, he didn't really talk much about that. Yeah, and of course they don't really do the Silver Age panel anymore because, like, the old rule of thumb <clears throat> that was said is, like, the Silver Age panel gets fewer and fewer every year because someone who was on it last year isn't on it this year. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's kind of a it's just sad thing. Yeah. They're passing, away. and it's it's so weird to be. I mean, what you're skirting around is that there were you no, know, they're passing away because of their age. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, it's funny for me because, or it's weird for me because, it seems like only a few years ago. You know, I moved to San Diego around 2000, and and I remember like uh, you know going down Artist Alley and seeing like Murphy Anderson. And going, you know, listen, I'm, you know, I, uh, I, I try to know a little bit about comic history, but I certainly didn't know much about that guy other than the, from his covers and how awesome they were. And I'm like, it was, it's so amazing that uh, sh so many short years ago we had we had golden age people, and now you know we're even losing the silver age possibilities. It's sad. Yeah, it's just you know. Time moves forward and not everyone moves along with us. And yeah. it's just unfortunate. Just like you see the graying of the industry thing. It's like a lot of the guys from the Silver Age are now in their, you know, eighties and nineties. And I mean, there's like a lot of strong holdouts that are still there, but like, you know, you know, they may not be with us for as long as we like. And, you know, so we just have to preserve like what we have, enjoy, and just take in as many stories and histories of these people as we can while they're still with us. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, make it contemporary before it becomes history. I, one thing I'm glad about is just that it's becoming so common that everything's recorded, so you can really record those. You know, I mean, uh, it's not like that's never happened in years past, but it, you know, it really relied on the con to either have someone doing it or to give permission to someone coming from outside. And so, the fact that this stuff that everybody's and and everybody's got cell phones, so you can, you know even just get some quotes by going on to YouTube, you know, and just doing a search for, for a panel or something. And, you know, it's, it's wonderful that, you know, you just preserve it like that. And cause I mean, just 
guys that we've lost in the past and like, you know, that, you know, passed in the eighties or nineties, people just like scraping at whatever video footage that they can. And like, you know, even if it's like, you know, lower quality stuff, that stuff right. being posted on YouTube. I mean, I will plow through every single interview with Jack Kirby that ever existed at Comic-Con, just like getting every single speck of inspiration that I can from what the man discussed. Mm-hmm. And so I just, the thing is, I always want more. And so just like, you always, you know, just find out more and more and more. Cause I mean, every interview, every discussion will bring something new to the frame. And so it, it it's just, but it's just never enough because as soon as someone passes, they just become like, well, they're gone. Now I have to learn everything about them. And right. it's like, I didn't learn enough about them. So like, you know, it's, so you just try to scrape at the past. I mean, cause I have a, background in archaeology so i just keep looking and looking and looking and digging and digging Mm -hmm. and digging and it's just you want more well you know of course i was reading uh uh uh, someone had complained to mark evanier about not doing the silver age panel anymore at comic-con and you know he went through this whole thing and and one of the things he mentioned was Stan Lee is one of the only guys around, and he doesn't like talking about the past. He only talks about the current projects. But it sounds like he did go a little bit into it, just kind of some brief, you know, kind of overviews. And, you know, the story about seeing a fly crawl across the wall and coming up with Spider Man, uh, allegedly. <laughs> and then, let's see. So it was that. Um, the Dark Matter Roundtable was the other one I went to. The what? Dark Matter, the TV show. Oh, sure, Dark Matter, yeah. Yeah, I did their roundtable, and then a few on-floor interviews with some toy companies. That was basically what I did during the day. Which toy companies did you uh, talk to? Um, Entertainment Earth, um, QMX, Quantum Mechanics, Diamond Select, and that was it, those three. Cool. Do you kind of a uh, booth tour with them and talk to them about their products, which and, I have videos up online. And your products stand out to you? Yeah, I got. <laughs> Diamond Select hooked me up with a their um, $200 gem edition of the Poison Ivy statue mm. and their um, Marvel Select, the new one for Riri Jones, the Comic-Con exclusive Unmasked. So I got reviews of both of those up. Sweet. And where can we read those reviews? Um, those reviews can be found on, um, I'll send them later, but on awkwardgirlpress.com. Okay. That's one of my friend's websites. Cool. Anything else you want to add? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Jason. Well, um, I uh, uh, was covering uh, uh, Comic-Con for both comic book resources and um and uh, my my own outfit, Hero Journalism. And so I, it's one of the things I like about covering for multiple organizations is they force me to go to some panels that I probably wouldn't go to. And it just always turns out to be an interesting experience. Even if the panel you know, is a misfire, usually there's something after it or something that I find out because I was there. But the panels I went to this year were great. Um, I went to the Jim Lee uh, Spotlight I think it's his 35th anniversary in the business or something like that. I, I can't recall, but that was that was pretty interesting. I mean, if you were around in the 90s when, or you just have gone back into those issues or whatever, when when you know you had the rise of of obviously Image, but even before that, when you know, I mean, X Men number one sold like eight million. <laughs> Thank you for chiming in. I know that's just so. <laughs> That's because that's one of the issues that they use to illustrate how crazy the sales numbers are from different eras in comparison and how what's what's a typical comic sell today? A chart topper will be about 100,000. 100,000 issues. So that just gives you uh, uh, an idea, a little snapshot of how different the industry is in the 90s. 8 million copies for one book. I mean, that's just amazing, of yeah. course. But, of course, what did issue number two sell? Ah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Power of variant covers and inclusive posters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah extra thick card stock. I have a ton of those things I got suckered into buying back mm-hmm. then. I had about five copies myself. We all did. That's why it sold 8 million. You know, there is one interesting thing about the Jim Lee panel. It was a panel, so you don't get to interview the guy, but I actually got up during the Q&A and asked him a question. 
because I it was as I was uh, uh, going through the panel, I was recording it and everything, and I was just thinking about his career, and I remembered, you know, thinking back to his X-Men days. Well, you know, any listeners that have heard my appearances here on Hall H know that I am a huge X-Men, the animated series fan, and it suddenly just clicked in my head. I'm like, oh my God, you know, all those characters, everybody knows that, all those character designs are right off of his designs right out of the X-Men book. And I'm like, wow, I, I should ask him about that. And so I'm sitting there in the audience and, <clears throat> and I'm thinking about it more and more. And I'm like, because I'm going back to that time when it was rare that you had good comic adaptations or even bad ones, really. I mean, there's hardly through the 80s and 90s, you can count. Well, through the 80s up to the 92 X-Men animated series, you can probably count the superhero shows on one hand, practically. So, so it was rare. And it was unheard of, unheard of that you did it off of a specific artist of that day. You could maybe trace some animation to to the artist, an artist style or whatever, but very rarely that it would be like concurrently to that moment. So he had this rare moment in, in comic book history, whereas a younger hotshot artist on one of the top selling books in the history of comics, and there's an animated show adapted based off of his artwork. Wow, what would that be like? And so that's the question I asked him. What do you say? It was a <laughs> letdown. <laughs> he said he didn't watch the show. I, 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 I was stunned. I couldn't believe it. I, I'm like, what? And um, so I got back to my seat, and I was crestfallen. <laughs> I, was, I can't tell you. I thought I'd been sitting on this question for like 20 minutes, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, I just can't wait to ask this. I can't wait to get his reaction. And then it was over, and I'm sitting down, and I'm like, I'm just in shock. I'm like, I can't believe it. This guy, I mean, even if it, maybe he's a very humble guy, because even out of just vanity, I would think any artist would be just like, like such an ego stroke to say, yeah, this cartoon, look at that. That's my character design. I mean, think about if... If it was Rob Liefeld's, I mean, I don't, I don't want to pick on the guy, but you got to assume he would be all over that, right? <laughs> so I'm sitting there in the audience, and I look over to the Q&A line, and there's like two or three people left. I grab my phone, and I look at the time, and I'm like, there's like at least 10 minutes left, mm -hmm. five to 10 minutes left, right? Uh -huh. So I got up, and I went back in line. I got back in line, <laughs> and so I get up there again. And I'm like, hey, it's me again. Uh, sorry, but I, I just, I just had to ask you. You, just, you weren't interested. I just, it was so, I was so baffled by that answer. <laughs> I had to go back and ask for more clarification. And you know, he, he did. He, he, I think he was a little. He didn't know what to say, so it was a little awkward. But um, uh, maybe he just didn't understand my perspective. But, but it, eventually, he said something to the point of that. Hey. I am a comic artist, and that's what I focus on. Uh, cartoon animation wasn't, you know, wasn't as a, a, a passion of mine. Um, so, so I, I found that one more acceptable. And he dropped a couple cool tidbits about how um, he actually did a voice in the X Men animated series, Dunphy. I don't know if you ever heard that, but he was uh, he played one of the Sentinels. Oh. Of course, you can't really tell because their their voices yeah, are modulated. Right, right. But he goes, "Halt, mutie," or something like that <laughs> in the in the uh, um, in the panel discussion or whatever. So that was pretty interesting. He said he did a few on Wildcats as well. But uh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was it was like pulling teeth though, trying to get any information on the animated stuff out from him. You know, I said. When, when, I real, when I realized I wasn't going to get any more on X-Men, I just thought, okay, you know what? I'm just going to throw Gen 13 out there because that movie never came out, I don't think. It was an animated movie based on his comic, and it got shelved. It was produced fully, but you have to you, – the only way to get his bootleg, I guess. And uh, he's like, yeah, yeah, we made that one too or something. He was just kind of acknowledging <laughs> that it existed or whatever. Uh -huh. and. And that was it. So, uh, that, but that was interesting. He's a really interesting guy. And I'll tell you one thing. Uh, the article that I wrote up for it for Comic Book Resources really focused on something that surprised me was 
there was this theme that ran throughout his panel about, you know, he was taught, he talked not only about his career, but about his life. And it was, uh, I did not realize how much of an immigrant story it is. I mean, he, he told stories about coming, uh, uh, from Vietnam when he was five years old and couldn't speak English and moved to like Iowa I mean, you can imagine the culture shock there, and, and it wasn't always uh, pleasant. Um, and uh, but he was it was something that he was you know definitely you know proud of and embraced. And you know, just considering uh, the current political climate, I thought that was a, a very interesting part of the show. A lot more personal than I thought he would talk about. Also, he's got nine kids. Can you believe I that? Did not know yeah, that. That's, yeah, that's whoa. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that is something. So uh, I did a couple other panels. Um, I did the Masters of the Sun, which was kind of cool. Got to talk to uh, Will I Am, and one of the interesting things for us comic nerds, especially uh, uh, our adaptation comic nerds, is how much of a role uh, the movie Wolverine played in in this development. Because uh, he said it was being cast in that movie, The Wolverine, Mm -hmm. or no, no, X-Men Origins Wolverine, um, uh, that really got him into script development. And he started working on script development after that. And then uh, uh, this comic project is an offshoot from the script. So I found that pretty interesting. Wolverine, getting people into comic books. Um, I also did um, Marvel vs. Capcom. I've never been a huge fighting game guy, but I love the history of some of those. I, I was also wanted to get to Street Fighter, right. uh, the anniversary panel, but did not. Um, and that was that was kind of cool. I mean, it's Marvel vs. Capcom, so you know what you're to expect going into it. But it was there was some pretty cool stuff in there. Um, I also did the Harley Quinn 25th anniversary panel, and that was fantastic. Yep, that, I was there too, and I think you uh, got in line and asked a question there, if I recall correctly. I did, I did, because if you uh, are a cognizant of the early days of comic book cartoons, and I'm I'm talking pre X Men, really. Um, the, there was, there's the concept, me and my friends called it an original character. Whenever the cartoon makers made characters that they injected into a Spider-Man, into a Fantastic Four, it was like an 80-90% likelihood they were going to be cheesy and take away from the dramatic value. You know, you get Wonder Dog and Marvin and what's-her-name from the first Super Friends, the kid, their sidekick kids that have no powers and everything. I mean, and the dog, you know, it's just... Uh, Miss Lyons from uh, Spider Friends. I mean, good heavens! (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, it was just whenever we would hear that, we'd immediately be on pins and needles because you're like, oh God, please don't, you know, direct the dramatic value of this thing that I love so much. And, and, you know, there was a turn in the 90s where you had some of the most interesting original characters, I think, in cartoon history. You know, we talked about Morph, I think, once from the X-Men show, but, but Harley Quinn is the queen. She is one of the most amazing comic adaptation creations, even though now she's a full-blown comic character because she has adapted back into the source material and then further down the adaptation tree into her own, you know, movie projects and such. It's, it's truly amazing. And it's one of the greatest original characters created, you know, for comic adaptation. And I don't think anyone ever makes that distinction. And so I made that distinction to Paul Dini, the co-creator of that character. And it was a great, it was a great moment because he just, took a moment to say, hey, wow, uh, I'm, I, I'm very flattered and humbled to hear you say that. Because I told him, I go, that is one, one of the greatest, or the, I, I think I said one of the greatest uh, uh, original characters in a comic adaptation in the history you know, of adaptations. And you know, I don't think he'd ever thought of it that way. I don't think many people do. But you know, I don't think once, once you point it out, who would argue with it? I mean, she's just a universally beloved character at this point. Mm-hmm. So those are the panels I went to. Um, uh, I did go to some off-site events. 
Uh, mainly, uh, I went to the Tick Takeover. Did any of you cats catch that? I, I sadly did not. Uh huh. I went through. Yeah, I got a press thing so I could skip the line. Were you there on Wednesday? No, I was there Saturday. Okay, I was there off hours on preview night. They had some asked me if I could come there for my press pass for that time, but that was fun. Uh, just just one out of ten. What do you give it, Dan? Just curious. Um, it wasn't really much tick based, as I would have liked. Probably about a six. It was good. Yeah, the um, scavenger hunt thing or the um, panic room thing was kind of cool. We had to find stuff, but it wasn't really much tick base to it. Right. Well, I would give it a little bit higher grade, and this is why. Uh, you know, I think I'd actually like to have some discussions about this sometime when we can get more into it because, you know, I only get to what I get to, and so I don't get to all of these things. But I have to say, um, you know, the ones I have, and when we're talking about, we're talking about these exhibits that are usually based off of a property that are trying to, usually a TV or film, right? And and you go into the exhibit, but really there's not going to be too much substance there, right? I mean, some of them are, ba like, for example, I uh, went to the Ender's Game exhibit that was off-site, pretty large facility, large enclosure. Did you go to that one, Dan? I did not. Okay. It was a little bit of a letdown. Did you go to that one, Alex? Okay. What did you think? I mean, was it, you know, a, a thumbs up for you? or what, the, what's your... the setup was pretty cool, you know, with the scenery and the sets and everything, but yeah, it was kind of... Can let down for that one. Well, I'm doing a video on uh, my channel, Hero Journalism, about some of the exhibits that I did, and and I mentioned the Ender's Game because I thought it was a pretty disappointing one. It was mainly you walking through sets from the movie. Now, a couple sets were cool. They had some that were like saddle, you know, inside the satellite up in space with some cool space suits and such. And there was one really standout moment I thought where there's a porthole looking at the earth you know you're in a satellite above earth and the sun's coming over it and that was a killer photo op i took like 10 pictures in front of that of just ponderously looking out into the universe i just that was that was a cool moment but but uh they had a green screen thing that made you look weightless sort of but it didn't really work i mean they weren't lifting you up you still had to just stand like you were weightless it was not that so you go through it and there's not much there a lot of the uh uh sections of it were boring there was the barracks of of the characters where they stay when they're in the military or whatever one of them was a living room L literally we walked into a living room and i had a couple mannequins with the costumes on and you're like why am i interested in this i i just found it boring so i i feel like these movie exhibits if you can for one moment one moment kind of make me feel like i'm part of the experience i think you did your job, you know, because they're usually going to dress it up with some, maybe some cool imagery as you're walking in and, you know, try to do some cool stuff like that or whatever. But, but you can't, it's not like Disneyland where you go on star tours and you're actually going on, you know, rides and stuff. And so I think some people, especially if you're not a, a frequent con goer, they don't know what we're, you know, what they're really in for there. So the tick, you're right. It was the scavenger hunt thing was a little bit not really tick related, but but the fact that they had those giant 20-foot tall tick antenna, and, and if you're, if, oh, yeah. when you're waiting in line to go in the tick takeover, you can control the antenna. <laughs> I mean, you can't control them as much as you'd like, but you can, you can set the, uh, the antenna to different expressions, and they move. And it's just like, that thing was, was pretty cool looking. So yeah, I, mean, I was there um, while they were setting that up, and they, had, they didn't have the uh, outside cover for it. So you could see the oh internal, the, the the animatronics yeah, or whatever. The, mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, it ended with. I mean, it was fun for us. I don't know if they did this for everybody, but they did the T-shirt at the beginning. You pick your T-shirt out, and you get to say what it wants, what you want it to say on it. Like I just did neat because that was a, a stock one, but I guess I could have done something custom. By the end of the thing, they already had our things printed, custom printed to what, you know, or, or maybe they just have a million different variations. I don't know. They, they had to print them on the spot there. Also, they had a special effects thing that put you, you probably saw that on my hero journalism page or whatever, that put me in that explosion, you know, this matrix bullet time shot. So it's like, I thought overall, you're right, The the some parts of it were kind of a little more just, you know, goofy or corny and not necessarily tick related but 
um, I, I, I just thought it was a fun time, a fun experience. So I kind of dug it. Um, the other one I did, uh, which was amazing, was Blade Runner. Did anyone here do Blade Runner? I didn't get out to it. Well, guess what, Matt? Uh, I am doing a blow-by-blow blow detail-oriented overview of it because I got footage from inside it. I got footage of the actors. I got footage of... Um, I, I, everything. I got footage of the VR. I even when when we when they strapped us into the VR headsets, I kept my camera rolling. And I just it was in my lap, and I just kept pointing it around at uh, you know my surroundings, not knowing what I was catching. And I actually you know got a few shots of people like you know in the D box motion seats and everything. And so and then I found um, you know it's already out on the market the Blade Runner VR. So I actually found some footage of that, so I'm going to splice that into my, uh, my overview or whatever. I think you guys will find that to be pretty interesting. Matt, Uncle Dunphy. Yes, Uncle Dunphy. Wow. What a Comic-Con it was. Jeez, what didn't I do? You know, I have so many regrets because there are so many things I didn't get to do, a whole lot of panels I didn't get to well, see. Well, we'll get to the regrets a little bit later because yeah. I have a few too. <laughs> okay. But, you know, there were a lot of things that I did get to do and did very much enjoy. I went to a lot of the DC Comics panels because I had to supervise a young man that I work with named Adrian Perez. He's a student at Little Fish Comic Book Studio. And anyone knows who knows Adrian knows that his enthusiasm for comics is just completely unparalleled and unmatched by anyone else. If he loves something, you will hear about how much he loves it. So he just goes to these panels and like just goes like and like and bolts over to the microphone and talks with these legendary creators. He will like describe every little detail about the character in every single way possible. And they're like, how does this little kid know so much about these books? And so at the at the DC Meet the Publishers panel, it was just adorable because they had Jim Lee and Dan DiDio had remembered Adrian from last year. Because last year at Comic Con How old is he? He's like 15. He's just like this little kid, and I've worked with him for a number of years now, and he wants to be the next great comic book writer. And like last at last year's Comic-Con, he like I left him alone for 10 minutes because I had to run to the restroom. And then I get back, and there's a text from my friend. Hey, I think that little kid that you were watching is up on stage right now. What? And I come back, and Adrian is on stage, and I'm like, that kid, I'm about to go up and whoop that ass. And like the next thing I know, like people are like, Asking questions. Okay, my question is for Adrian Perez. How do you get so smart when it comes to comics? All right, well, let me tell you about that. Well, you know, I studied at Little Fish Compost, and like, what happened? My friend told me. Yeah, he got up on stage. He goes to the window. He goes to the microphone, and then he describes the entire history of the uni- the DC universe in two minutes, and then actually asked Jim Lee a question about how a bunch of stories that he was reading in the new comics were like had features that we're seeing in like old Wildstorm comics and says, so does that mean the Wildstorm universe is coming back? And Jim Lee broke his own non-disclosure agreement and admitted, yes, the DC universe is coming back and merging with Wildstorm. Like, and he got him to admit it. And that was just, you know, but, and of course this year it was just great with Adrian too, because all these wonderful comic creators just hanging out and about with him and just like him, them, just him meeting them. Um, the highlight of Comic-Con for me was, of course, the Eisner Awards. I always like attending the biggest night in comics. And, of course, for the uninitiated that don't know what the Eisners are, they're like the Oscars for Comic-Con. And, yeah, so comics have an award show for best writer, best ongoing series, best artist. So we just celebrate the best of the best. The Eisners were really great. It got uh, crashed by Wayne Brady. He showed up to announce that he is doing his own comic imprint that is, you know, going to reach out to uh, you know, black youth, and he was hilarious on stage. And at the Eisner Awards, I was like, you know, dressing up and schmoozing with this. And uh, Adrian uh, tagged along as my plus one, which was, you know, really cool. So he'd never been before. And, you know, one of the highlights for me was at the end of the, at the, end of the night, uh, you know, it's a little after party, and I introduced him to Dave Gibbons. And it's like, Adrian, I'd like you to meet Dave Gibbons. And he's like, <gasps> Oh my god, oh my god, I've read Watchmen like 50 times. Oh my god, how did you do this? And they're not sent to all this and they're from the script. And it's like, everyone there was just like, wait, what? 
And then afterwards, he also got to meet Phil Lamar. It's like, Adrian, I want you to meet Phil Lamar. Oh my God, I love Samurai Jack. You shaped my youth. I like because you're the voice of Green Lantern, and like I just grew up reading, just like watching Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. Oh my, and just he's getting to mingle with all these great creators, and it's just seeing his enthusiasm. He was just the he was the life of the party, as he always is, and. Aside from the Eisner Awards, I also attended the uh, one of my other my second favorite panel every year at the at the show, which is Quick Draw. So Quick Draw, you know, seeing Scott Shaw and Sergio Aragonis and a bunch of guest cartoonists just strut their stuff just to see, you know, the just how you know entirely capable they are as cartoonists and entertain this huge crowd and this huge audience. And I just had an absolute blast. I I really had, you know, a fantastic time at a lot of after parties too, sometimes like not getting back to like four in the morning. Trust me, I was doing anything and everything. But for me, this Comic Con was a little more work than playtime because now as chairman of San Diego Comic Fest, I was going around, you know, mingling with possible guests, talking with some folks. And, you know, we do have some bites for the uh for the convention that I can't discuss just yet, but uh, I'm very happy with it. And uh, we got some really cool guests coming on board for next year at Comic Fest, and so I'm really getting a, getting a good feel, and I was really excited for that. Not even, not even a little bit of a teaser? Nah, not even a little bit of a teaser. <laughs> Rats. Mm -hmm. Alex. Oh, me, next. Uh, some panels, I think first one I did was, um, since it was Jack Kirby's kind of, I did uh, highlight on Mike Royer, spotlight on him, and just talked about some of his, you know, his, his history in the comic industry and working with Jack Kirby. That was pretty cool. I actually got his, uh, his nameplate signed. You can't see it, but it's pretty cool. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Picture time. That's Royer, Mike Royer? Mike Royer. Wow, yeah. but you got a couple of them. Jeez. Uh -huh. And um, see what else? Okay, yeah, keep going, keep going. What else should I do? Um, this one's for Jason. This one's for Jason. Oh, this was uh, the other panel was uh, I think it was a uh, the tribute to to Jack Kirby, and uh, one of uh, I got he he brought up probably about a dozen guests onto stage, so he just rotated seats, and uh, one that showed up was Kurt Busick, which is uh. Uh, <laughs> a favorite for one of our guests here, Jason. <laughs> so, the backstory there is if you'd heard that, I had to. <laughs> we were talking about Comic Con and um, how uh, how you you know you're running into these celebrity heroes of yeah. yours, right? And um, and uh, so uh, I had this story about how I, I loved Kurt Busick in the 90s. I was, I just, you know, just connected to his book so much. And, and, you know, in the early aughts or whatever, I was at a Comic Con and I was walking down an aisle and I look over and there's Kurt signing autographs with two people in front of him. And I quick grabbed a book and I went up and I was kind of a little awkward and he wasn't too pleased and <laughs> it was a really unpleasant experience, <laughs> definitely a letdown. So this is, this is awesome. I love it. I oh, love it. Hey, well, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was like, because when he said his name, I go, where did I hear that name from? Like, well, that's the guy Jason was talking about from the previous podcast. You didn't tell him the story, did you? No. <laughs> So I had, I had to, I had to get, his, get his autograph for, for Jason. That is awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, another um, one that I went to was, uh, I don't know if you, people have seen this YouTube channel, uh, Men at Arms Who Forged. They build uh, real-life uh, weapons from video say, games. say it again. What's it called? Men, Men, at, Men at Arms Reforged. It's gotcha. a YouTube channel. Right, right, right. And um, they make, uh, they're actually uh, real blacksmiths that make, Weapons from TV shows, video games, movies, and, you know, like the Wonder Woman shield, Thor's hammer, um, no, numerous Kill Bill, Samurai Sword. Mm -hmm. they, they make all those that people, you know, fans request. You know, it's cool just hearing their story and, you know, seeing them in person and hearing them chit-chat with, with fans afterwards. It was here actually here in the uh, Central Library in the auditorium, so it's pretty cool, pretty cool venue to, yeah. to watch them. Uh, another one, uh, I went to... Uh, um, the Black Eyed Peas one, Masters of the Sun, with 
That right was so Jason. yeah. Neat to run into you yeah. there. That's you know, it's that's one of the great con things is you always just end, you know run into some people and uh-huh. uh, that's always a great experience. Oh yeah, yeah it was a packed house in there. It was. It was. It was. Yeah. Probably what you mean thousand thousand people. Yeah, I'd least. say so. It was one yeah. of the what was that like six, six AB or yeah, something like that. Like that's that. that's a big, big room. Yeah. yeah. And they were, they seemed pretty pretty hyped to be there too. Oh, yeah. And they'd never been they'd never been to Comic Con before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah. No Fergie. I don't know if she's part of the I, I think she's <laughs> left the band. What? Yeah. No Fergie. I think I just heard that she's left but I it was after Comic Con, a few days afterwards, but I remember because someone was like, "Oh, is Fergie going to be on the panel?" No, no, it's just uh, it's just Will I Am, Apple, and Taboo. But um, but a few days later, I thought I heard that she was leaving the band, so that might have been partially why. Also, maybe she might not have had that much involvement in the comic book, you know. Um, Taboo and Apple, I guess, did give him a little bit of, especially Taboo, give him some feedback and input during the whole process. So they were kind of involved in it, um, even though Will was doing the direct writing or whatever. So who knows? Maybe Fergie's a huge comic fan, but I think there, you know, maybe she wasn't too involved in it. That might have been why she wasn't here, but also might not be in the band. Yeah. And I went to some of the same panels as Aaron and Jason, like pop culture, Shark Tank, and uh, the Will I Have, or Black Eyed Peas one. Mm-hmm. Um, another one I went to was uh, right after the tribute to Jack Kirby one was the X-Men, or Marvel Resurrection, which had some writers um, from Marvel talking about like current issues and stories, storylines going on, which was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. I got Mark Guggenheim. He's he also directs uh, the Arrow TV show. He's the yeah. executive producer. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, <clears throat> kind of runs. Uh, he's one of the big shots in the DC uh, CW live action world of yeah. TV shows. Yeah, I think because he's a producer on multiple, Arrow. if not all of them. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I got his. Which is funny because Arrow's got to be winding down, I would assume, by now. <laughs> it's like, what? how many seasons in are they? It's got to be like five, six seasons, right? I think it's season five is starting this year. It's five oh. or six. Well, that's not quite as far ahead as I thought, because Flash is, that's only, what, two seasons ahead of Flash then? Or? Yeah, Arrow Season 6, I think, starting. Yeah, Arrow Season 6. Okay, so that's still two or three years ahead of at least the most recent next one. But yeah, with you know so many coming up and coming, it seems like that one might it's, it's be... It's probably because they do a lot of crossover episodes, so it just seems so much more. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Yeah, I was kind of light on panels this year. Um, that's about it for me. Mm-hmm. I guess we'll get into uh, some of our top five moments. Um, mine's a little bit long just because there was a lot of stuff that happened and I tried to sort of properly manage my time at Comic-Con this year in terms of work and fun. Work. <laughs> <laughs> so, so obviously, uh, preview night, we had a game of bloggers. and so That's something that we like to go to every year. It's hosted by Tony Kim, crazy for Comic-Con. Um, so we saw Tony there, we saw Leonard Sultana, Englishman in San Diego, uh, Alyssa Franks from uh, Friends of CC Forum and the blog. We saw Jeff Muller, uh, the Mighty Jerd, uh, Sully and Steve from Nerd Foo, uh, Hot Nerd Girl and Mama Jedi, uh, our friend Corey Commander, um, the con guy, uh, Danielle, angsty nerd. Uh, it was cool, you know, finally a chance to meet her. We had a lot of interaction online. And also Tim from Under the Capes. Um, I was a guest on his podcast, so it was cool to, to finally meet him. Tim who? Tim. Um, he runs a podcast, Under yeah. the Capes. Yeah, Under the Capes. Austin, gotcha. Austin, yeah. Austin area. Yeah. Um, and then the Saturday after parties, um, I must have danced like all night. You know, it was, it was crazy. I, I haven't danced that much in a long time. Yeah. I even ran into you at the dance. That's right, at the House of Blues, um, at the... Uh, uh, the Red Wedding, and then afterwards, I went to uh, the Screen Junkies after party uh, with Alyssa, Devora, and uh, Aaron Lynn. Um, yeah, that was a fun night. <laughs> um, and then I mentioned work earlier. We were pretty busy, you know, talking to a lot of people, a lot of artists and artists. Ali, <clears throat> uh, we tended, you know, a bunch of panels, and we managed to squeeze in five podcasts. 
at uh, San wow. Comic Con. So our first one. We're cranking it out. Yeah, our first one was with, was with Karma from Second Union. Uh, she's a fellow content creator. Uh, they're getting ready to launch their own podcast, so we're looking forward to, to hearing that. Oh, Karma Savage? Yeah, it's Karma. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Stefan Frank, I mentioned him earlier, he is the uh, creator of the comic book Silver. Uh, it was really good to, you know, talk to him in length because we've met him in other uh, cons in, in the past and it was kind of cool because he is uh, having a Kickstarter campaign for uh, his third volume, I believe. So it was kind of cool to sort of, you know, get to know him a little bit better. Uh, we got to talk about, you know, him, him growing up in France, uh, his exposure to uh, American comics when, I guess, they didn't allow American comics until like the late 70s in France. So it was kind of cool. He was, you know. I picked up the third volume of uh, Silver and I've been dying to read it. I completely forgot. Mm-hmm. I just bought it at Con because it's so caught up with other things. It's nice. Like, uh, yeah. yeah, you'll love it. I mean, it's a really uh, takes a film noir approach. It takes place in the 1930s. Um, and it's basically about treasure hunters trying to steal silver from vampires. So um, it's. Uh, uh, Stefan was a pretty cool guy because he comes from a uh, cinematic background. He worked on Iron Giant. Um, he was. Let's not forget Space Jam, the greatest film of all time. <laughs> <laughs> and he he does panels where he sort of talks about him parlaying his uh, cinematic experience into sequential art. So in terms of perspective, panel layout, you know, it's it's really interesting panel. So I encourage anybody that. Go to a convention and Stefan Frank has a panel. You know, check it out. It's pretty much about uh, cinematic storytelling uh, uh, in comic books. Uh, we also talked to uh, David uh, Pepos. He is the writer for a comic book called Spencer and Locke. If you can imagine uh, Calvin Hobbes meets Sin City, that's basically what Spencer and Locke is about. Um, I'm looking forward to reading that. Uh, we it was an interesting conversation, and uh, I'll be posting the uh, that podcast soon. Uh, we also talked to Ureas, uh, the creator of Black Heroes Matter. Um, we met him last year. He attended our, uh, our Artist Assemble uh, meet and greet uh, last year. Um, so it was kind of cool uh, catching up with him this year, and he agreed to be on our podcast. So that was a pretty cool uh, conversation. We were, <laughs> we were at the Hilton Bayfront. It was pretty loud, so hopefully the audio comes out okay. <laughs> but it was cool talking to Ureas again. He talked about uh, some of the projects he's working on. He has a project uh, besides Black Heroes Matter. Uh, he has a project that's sort of in, um, per, sort of in, in, in talks. Yeah, uh, he's sort of working with uh, Wesley Snipes' production company. Um, and lastly, on Sunday we had a sort of uh, SDCC Fit podcast, sort of like a recap and sort of you know talking about how SDCC Fit. Uh, helped a lot of uh, you know the people that attended. Um, some of the people that uh, were on that podcast were Jeff Muller, uh, the Mighty Jerd, uh, Kevin Walwyn. Uh, he's a big supporter of, of uh, SDCC Fit. He lives out in New York, and he's the current editor in chief for the uh, Friends of Comic Con blog. Um, Brian and Stephanie Gray, uh, and also Karma Savage. She was there too, along with myself and uh, Alex. Um, the fourth, the fourth thing that uh, uh, sort of like was my, you know, part of my top five in at San Diego Comic Con was just seeing past podcasts, podcast guests, you know, doing their thing. You know, I, I mentioned Jason Inman and Nancy Robinson earlier. It's cool just seeing their their project Jupiter Jet. You know, just you know, the, the actual holding the, the first issue in, in your hand. It's it's so cool to see. Um, I mentioned Keith and Jones earlier. His Power Knights number three came out. So. Um, I was glad to pick that up um, and, you know, sort of talk with him a little bit in length about uh, other projects that he's working on. Of course, he shared the booth with uh, Bobby Rubio, so it's always good to see Bobby. Uh, actually, although Bobby wasn't, hasn't been on our podcast yet, he was actually our first interview back in 2014. So I'll go back and read that. Uh, this pretty good interview that uh, me and Alex did with Bobby. Um, Jeff Martinez, he's a recent uh, podcast guest. He's a current... Uh, production artist at DC Comics, uh, handling sort of like the the the, the, the digital um, versions of, of the comic books. Um, we also uh, caught up with Jeff Pasquale from P- Pasquale Productions. He's a badass uh, watercolor artist. Um, Eric Ninotowski was there, um, and also I mentioned Susan Botello and uh, Anthony Delacruz. They were both uh, podcast guests, um, and it was you know, it's just cool just seeing all these creators just you know that we've had on the show. 
just, you know, doing their thing. So it's, it's awesome to see. Um, and then the fifth thing was uh, meeting and talking uh, a little bit more with, uh, with Arlen Schumer. Because after his panel, I kind of struck up a conversation with him, and I ended up getting his book, The, uh, the Silver Age Art. So I'm um, looking forward to having him on the podcast. So he's, he's down. Uh, he said anytime. So we'll I'll have to get in touch with him again. Fantastic. Yeah. So, Dan, what was your top five moments at uh, Comic-Con? Um, top five. One of them, I, on Saturday, I wa- went to the NBC party. Right when I walked in, Peter Mensa, who was on Cla- or, um, Spartacus, he was right there. He walks, out, walks in, or I walk in, he was right there. He tells me, go get a drink right off the bat, which is kind of cool. I ran into Chris Hardwick and talked to him briefly at that party. Um, after the Lego Ninja Go um, press conference, I was in the hallway, walked past, and Zach Woods, who also played Jared on Silicon Valley, I told him I liked him both shows and The Office. He goes, hey, what's your name? He kind of said hi to me. We talked for a little bit. It was kind of cool. Um, the Stan Lee panel was kind of cool, hearing Stan just talk about whatever. And that's about it. Cool. Jason, your top five. Yeah, I'd have to say uh, the big, putting Jim Lee on the spot was a, a, an amazing moment, um, and and then uh, uh, having this, a similar moment with uh, Paul Dini, uh, giving him some paying some homage to him on his character creation. Uh, those were two great moments. Um, I really thought the Blade Runner uh, experience was probably. I mean, <clears throat> I hesitate to say this because if you were like about to get in line, you'd probably be disappointed once you saw it. But I'd say it was the best movie, you know, experience type exhibit that I've seen at Con. Um, like I said, that's why I kind of went into that story about the Ender's Game. I didn't want to, you know, uh, distract from the topic, but it's just, you know, that's why I'd like to have a conversation uh, uh, like this, just talking about those and comparing notes on what people thought about different ones over the years because this one I thought it was about as as immersive as anything that I'd ever done at Comic-Con and it it had more of the of just stuff than than most of the ones so I I thought that was great and you can hear a com- the most detailed blow by blow account of it on the internet when I get my video out on herojournalism.com and Facebook slash Hero Journalism because I've got uh, a very detailed, exhaustive overview that I'm working on for it with pictures, video, uh, audio, the whole nine yards. So if you didn't get to see it, you'll be able to basically experience what it was like to to do it through that video. Um, other than that, I'd say that, well, I think I, that brings me up to five, so I'll let it go at that. <laughs> oh, I'll keep on going. It's cool. Um, <clears throat> I thought, you know, there was a couple things that I just really, you know, it was uh, great to see Marv Wolfman again. Marv Wolfman, classic, you know, silver, well, maybe bronze, bronze age, Marvel and DC creator, um, you know, and, and, you know, again, uh, sometimes you, it's harder to find some of those creators from what you might say yesteryear, but influential with the Teen Titans. Yeah, that, yeah. That, well, that's what's crazy is among those ty- that level of creator, that era of creator, his stuff is strangely a lot more relevant than his peers because uh, he had so much influence on the Teen Titans universe, and then that has had so much impact now in DC's adaptation universes between the cartoons and the live action, the characters are starting to, you know, pop up and everything. So I I thought that was very interesting to see him again. I think Raven is actually his original character, I believe. Yeah. And I think Deathstroke also. hmm. Uh, Several. I think several of the Teen Titans world characters are are his creations from that legendary run on it, yeah. I ran into him at the Starbucks during WonderCon. Oh, really? (laughs) Just this past WonderCon? Yeah. Okay, great. I interviewed him like, God, 10 or 15 years ago at Con, um, you know, when I was first starting to work on some documentary projects and such. In fact, one of my goals is I'm going to try to dig up that interview and, and put it online. He looked quite different then, but uh, so did I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, that's, that's pretty much it for my moments. Cool. Uncle Dunphy. Well, of course, I had a night of my life at the Eisner Awards, as I often do. That was uh, wonderful, so that was a cool moment for me. And then uh, just like, you know, and once again, like 
one of the things I love, I just love like seeing dreams come true. So like seeing Adrian talk with like, you know, Dave Gibbons and Phil Lamar and all these, you know, creators that have inspired him over the years. It's just it's just so nice and so gratifying. I I just I just had a blast with it. And so it's just kinda hard like you know to narrow down like the other moments because those are definitely the uh the top two that I really enjoyed. And um Let's see, other stuff that I liked, uh, there, of course, there's Saturday night, just, you know, getting together with all my friends and just, you know, partying all through a downtown around to the House of Blues and running around to, oh, yeah, we would, I mean, we were at the Comic Art Gallery, we were at the House of Blues, we were at the Stone Brewery, like, we went to, like, and then finished at the Hilton Bayfront with everyone, and then finally getting back at, like, four in the morning and all of us just sitting with a collective, like, that was awesome. We are, uh, I am so thrilled that 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 went down and yeah we we're just having so many wonderful and then because like I can't even think of everything that comes to mind I usually don't get jumbled about this because you guys know I'm pretty precise when it comes to my comic conning experiences <laughs> and maybe you haven't recovered yet <laughs> I haven't recovered yet. but it's just always so good to see so many great people and I did have some uh, you know fanboy moments it, meeting Eduardo Riso because like that guy never does North American shows. Just meeting him and getting to talk with him about like you know, one hundred. Is he based in UK or something? South America. Oh yeah. So getting him into the scene was just like wow. That was just so awesome. Just you know going to the Pokemon room to see my old friends and whatnot. Because no matter what you, you know. Really- I had, I don't mean to interrupt, but well, just before you move on past Riso, um, I had a little Riso moment. Not really personally, but. I was going through Artist Alley. That's one of my first things to do is just get the lay of the land, see who's there. And I immediately recognized the name. Now, I'm not an expert in every area of comics. I knew of him, and I knew his work, and I knew I'd read it. I knew him basically through 100 Bullets, even though I probably read a few of his other things. But I knew that one of my buddies had a TPB of 100 Bullets. And so that night when we were getting back from con, I go, hey, you know, you should grab your 100 Bullets and, and get uh, uh, and bring it down tomorrow. And he did. And he saw Edward and, and, uh, um, and got it signed or whatever. And I didn't realize, I guess, how rare of a, <laughs> how cool that was because you say he doesn't do American shows and everything. Yeah, that's the first time I've seen him do a North American show. So he was definitely like, you know, the, like, highest priority on my list of people to meet this year. So That's and, awesome. And he was just nice as can be. And, like, my, I'm so jealous of my friend Kiri. She got one of the few sketches he did. He did four sketches. And it was this wonderful one of Thomas and Martha Wayne where, uh, from Flashpoint where Thomas Wayne has become Batman and uh, Martha Wayne, driven insane by the death of her son, became the Joker and just them collectively. And it's like it's just like the most beautiful image. I'm like, I am so, so jealous of this. But yeah, so that for me, it's like those are standout moments and I can't really think of others because I had so many because it was great, but it was, you know, it was for me, it was work and it was playtime, but I'm happy that we all had fun. Let's see, for me, the top five, it's kind of like a TMZ list. Um, <laughs> I think first one was, I don't know, every year I always see Rob Liefeld outside of panels or in the exhibit booth whether it be at Hilton, Bayfront, or just walking the floor. This year I saw him at the Sales Pavilion, but every year I always see Rob Liefeld walking around somewhere. Um, Friday, I uh, saw Olivia Munn get into, I don't, know, I don't know where she was going or what panel she was at this year, but saw her outside in the Omni Hotel. She was there for the of... Lego Ninja Go oh, okay. table. Oh, she's the voice, yeah. the voice over there. Okay. Yeah, I saw her on Friday. Did they pronounce it that way, Dan? Ninjago? Yeah. Yeah. Is that how they pronounce it? Yeah. I thought it was Ninjago. Yeah. I've Sorry, heard it yes. Ninjago. Ninjago. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So it is Ninjago. Ninjago. Okay, yeah. got it. All right. <laughs> I was pronouncing it phonetically. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but. <laughs> um, Saturday, um, saw Robert Kirkman coming out of the hotel in the morning and walking over to the convention center. Uh, a lot of people didn't notice him, but, you know, a few fans did, and he was, you know, Pretty cool guy. I took pictures and signed autographs for people. Um, and Saturday was, we're hanging out at a friend's booth, 1943, Bobby Rubio's. And because uh, last year, the Suicide Squad, Suicide Squad walked over from the back of this convention to the DC booth. And his booth is right in the path. And this year, Justice League 
um, had a signing at the DC booth, so we camped out at his booth and got ready to take pictures of the Justice League. So we got, you know, Gail, um, Dot, um, what else was there? Do, 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 do. Some other people. <laughs> oh, Manoa, uh, Affleck, Affleck, Ben Affleck, <laughs> Affleck, and uh, the other cast members. So that was pretty cool. The entire cast? Um, the main. Yeah, the main, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. The entire Justice League characters. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Batman, wow. Batman, Wonder Woman, Superman. Or oh, Superman wasn't there. I didn't um, even know Cyborg, that's what you were getting Flash. at. <laughs> <laughs> that's <Flash> amazing. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. Um, another cool highlight was just seeing uh, the international and Comic Con International. There were exhibitors from China, Chile. Uh, New Zealand, some European booth. So that was pretty cool seeing mm-hmm. actually international presence exhibiting that. Oh, Russia. Russia was there too. Um, and another highlight was playing with a new 360 camera I had. So we got some cool pictures and got still got some more to post. That's it for me. That's the one you've used uh, on the podcast, right? Yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah, those 360 images are pretty cool, man. You know, I got a little, I don't know where we can fit it in, so I'm just going to interject. I got another little anecdote that uh, needs to be discussed on the Hall H podcast because it came about because of the Hall H podcast. Um, We were leaving con, like, first or second day, me and a couple buddies, and... And I'm like, I just wanted to get out of there. I wanted to get home. I wanted to get in the Uber and get home and just, you know, sit on a couch and just rest because I was so tired from walking 100 miles. And the, uh, my buddies are like, no, 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 we need to get some food first. What should we do? You know, and we we're kind of going back and forth. And, and I'm like, I'm like, okay, if we're going to do something, let's do something that you can do fairly quickly with maybe a minimal crowd. And they're like, so we're going over to like just some easy options and they're talking about doing mexican because one of my buddies is in from out of town Uh and i'm like then we got to do lolitas or you know that's actually it was my my uber plan is always to get dropped off there Mm -hmm. and so we had gotten dropped off there in the morning and and then so i'm like hey we'll just do lolitas and they're like "Eh, is that a good spot and i go the hall h podcast recommended it it's got to be a great spot (laughs) They're like, what? I go, yeah, my buddy uh, Aaron and Alex that do the Hall H podcast, that is one of the specific places that they recommended. So, you know, of course, we went in and we, we went there and they loved it. There was one drawback. They, this, you're not going to believe this, but they ran out of tortillas. <laughs> Comic Con, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so you got to do the low carb option. <laughs> yeah, they would see. Uh, my, they weren't too thrilled with the wait time we had because there was a little backup because of the tortilla issue. But uh, but that was that was a nice thing when you get one of your tips. Just it led to a great experience. So awesome. I guess we can talk a little about tips a little bit later. Um, <laughs> yeah, because trust me, if you want Comic Con pro tips, Uncle Gun- Uncle Dumpy will hook you up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, you know, I had a, such a I had such a good experience at this year's con that I didn't think that I had a, a lot of regrets. But uh, you know, after a few days went by and like you know it's like almost two weeks, I'm like, I did miss a lot, and so I do have a, a bunch of regrets. Um, some of it uh, include. Um, Missing our friend Jeff Martinez's off-site meet and greet at uh, North Park uh, Brewery. Um, he had a meet and greet. What day was that, Alex? That was that. Uh, was it Thursday? Yeah, and we, unfortunately we couldn't make it because um, you know, we're always done to support people that we've had on the podcast or people that we know, and so it would have been cool to you know go to his meet and greet. Um, we didn't get to connect with uh, Danielle again for the podcast. She's from angstynerd.com. Um, we didn't get a chance to podcast with uh, Keith and Jones and Bobby Rubio. Uh, we were hoping to do a podcast at their panel, but you know I want to be respectful of their time because they're you know busy trying to you know meet with their their fans and everything. So I didn't want to intrude too much. So hopefully we can get them on the podcast at a later date. Um, I regret missing the Young Justice panel. Um, there was a panel about sort of graphic design and cover art that I wanted to check out. Being a graphic designer myself, there was a cool panel about. Uh, uh, manga superheroes, basically uh, the differences between uh, Japanese and um, U.S. comics. I kind of find that subject matter interesting. 
Um, Alex went to a few of Mike Royer's panels. Um, I, I regret not being able to make those just because Mike Royer is such a character and he has a lot of stories that uh, you know, are really entertaining and, and fun to hear. He's so entertaining. <laughs> he's always a life of the party every time you Yeah, him. he's hilarious too. He's just a firecracker. Yeah, and uh, Matt. At Matt, that age, too. How old is the guy? Well, probably late seventies now. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> I wish I was as entertaining at you know thirty as he is at seventy. Right. Um, Matt mentioned Quick Draw. Um, I think this might be the second year in a row that I, I missed it just because I was trying to work on some other things. I regret not going to Quick Draw because I always loved that panel. And this, it's a good place to like just hang out for a little bit because you know if, I would, they kind of group. I'm not sure if it, how it was the same this year, but they kind of group Quick Draw and and. Uh, the uh, the uh, animated voices, I think. Yeah, they always follow uh, animated voices with uh, with Mar- quick draw because uh, you know Mark Avenue, that yeah. way Mark Avenue doesn't have to move. Right, exactly. So those are a good block to just hang out and, and rest if you want, and you get a good show for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mentioned Rob Sockwitz earlier. Um, I only was able to attend two of his panels, but I think he had a lot more. I got to hang out with Rob at the Eisner Awards. I think it's see him else anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Didn't can see enough of him. That's just one of the problems. I want to spend enough time hanging with everyone, and you just can't do it. There's just too much to do, too many people to see. It's yeah. like, though for me, if I have one big regret, is not doing enough of my own thing. Because, you know, I did bring on a couple of people who have never really attended Comic Con before, so I kind of had to, like, guide them through all the way. And so there's, like, this nagging thought in the back of my mind I've got to be doing my own thing. I'm missing this. I'm missing that. It's like, you're taking too long and so like you know it's it's one of my own rules that I do it's like you know you know I can hold your hand along the way but at the same time it's like I got to do my own thing I only get one week a year to do San Diego comic-con so I got to make the most of it yeah I'm surprised that (laughs) he did that I mean I we talked about this I think kind of on the preview uh podcast about con I'm like because I, I run so well, I get people that ask me about it, and I get uncomfortable. Whenever I'm with someone, I'm uncomfortable because I'm either thinking, oh, this is boring for them, I'm not, you know, that they're not having enough fun, or I'm thinking I would rather just be, have no encumberments at all to just be able to go where I think I want to go to find something, to talk to someone, to get an interview, to do whatever, and so... You know, I, I I tell people I'm not there really for fun fun. I'm there for work fun, so I'm not a good person to go with or whatever. You're just not a good person at all. <laughs> well. Uh-oh. Give me some fisticuffs later. I do turn down all those people that say, hey, can I go to con with you? Though most of those are just jerks looking for a free pass that I can't get anyways. Hey, person I haven't talked to in six years. Oh, you want, to, you want me to give you a Comic-Con pass? Okay. <laughs> of course. <laughs> We're waiting in line six hours for that freebie exclusive that oh, you could... Of course I'll show up at the Funko booth at 6 a.m. and buy you that, <laughs> that exclusive that has a Comic-Con sticker on it. Of course I'll do that. <laughs> oh... Well, I don't regret doing any of that. Um, <laughs> uh, lastly, um, I mentioned Arlen Schumer earlier. I wish I had more time to talk to him and have him on the podcast, but we'll have to save that for a later date. And um, another artist that we follow, I regret not you know, getting a chance to meet uh, Art Germ. He's a pretty cool artist. Um, maybe next year. So, <laughs> um, Dan, do you have any re- regrets from this uh, Comic-Con? Just not seeing as much as I possibly could have on the floor. Because I was running around, so I didn't really get a chance to explore the floor as much as I wanted to, and some of the offsite stuff. Cool, Jason. Uh, yeah, I didn't really get to do the uh, Kirby stuff, the Royer panel, or just the main Kirby panel. Did Royer have his own yeah. panel? I thought so. Um, he had like two panels, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, I. Uh, also, I haven't checked in with them to see if they were they came or not. Maybe you know, Dunphy. Um, did uh, Eric Lewald, was he down there? Did they get on any panels, X-Men, the animated series? I did not see at the time. Yeah, I didn't either, and I meant to follow up to see what I missed because I assumed them having a, such a great presence at San Diego Comic Fest that I figured that they would be down there again. And it's the 25th anniversary. I'm actually... 
a little disappointed that Comic Con didn't do, you know, have you know any kind of a thrust like you guys did at Comic Fest, Matt, to commemorate that and. Or, or you know what? Maybe they did something and I just missed it. But that really bummed me that I didn't get more X Men TAS action. Yeah, I'm I'm bummed too. But that's why Comic Fest is so good because we hear your thoughts, your <laughs> love of X Men. When other people won't respect your love of X Men, San Diego Comic Fest will be there for it because we knew you grew up with X Men, and we knew y'all love X Men because it's the greatest theme song of all time. <laughs> hey, did you, do you know anything about a reboot of the X Men cartoon? Yeah. Uh, really? It's like, it, I mean, there's going to be, you know, I know they're going to reboot you know, cartoons now and, ever, and forever, but it's like, I don't know the whole situation about, like, you know, are they going to redo an X Men cartoon? Have I you, thought, have you thought, heard of it, though? Am I, is this the first you're hearing of it? Uh, it's kind of the first I'm hearing of it because I thought, like, X Men was kind of still in the doghouse because of what uh, Ike Perlmutter did and, like, you know, like, but I guess with Ike out and... With, with what he did with the MCU stuff or what he did back in, in the well, X-Men with the, cartoon? With the, MCU, with the MCU stuff, just about, like, you know, right. Fantastic Four and, like... Oh, yeah, X-Men oh, not gotcha, yeah, that, like, not uh, like uh, downgrading the comics' uh, profile within the Marvel lineup of titles and such. That's a funny way to say cancel. <laughs> <laughs> Diplomatic. I was trying not to be too acerbic, which is a rarity for me. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, this is the first I'm hearing about an X Men cartoon. I, I, I don't know. If they, I just saw something on a Twitter uh, the other day, and it said something about like a reboot or something. And I'm like, I'm like, wow, that that sounds interesting. But I, 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 it may just be nonsense because I haven't heard of anything of it elsewhere. And if you haven't heard of it, it probably didn't happen. Moving on. Yeah, because I mean, if, if I don't talk about it, then it didn't happen. It doesn't exist. If I don't talk about it, it's fake news. <laughs> <laughs> Just as an aside, do you prefer reboot or remake? Um, I don't even like either of those. Um, I don't like... I like relaunch because relaunch is more likely to reflect that it's within continuity. You know, we've got all these reboots happening in Hollywood RoboCop Ghostbusters all these ones that start that are just they're remakes okay that's what they mean by reboot they mean remake or reboot from the very beginning start um, well I guess the reason why they use reboot is less of a negative connotation in terms of like oh than remake yeah yeah well t- okay for me they're all negative connotation of course <laughs> you know it's funny in comic books they would sometimes use the word reboot uh, with the new number one, but they never meant it to like reboot the continuity. I mean, in, except for in rare situations like uh, in the 80s when they did the Superman Man of Steel with John Byrne or whatever, that was a kind of a, a redoing of his continuity. Does that sound right, Matt? I don't know if you're if you're knowledgeable on that when Byrne you know, uh, started over with Superman in the 80s with Man of Steel or whatever. Yeah, and he did that uh, miraculous Time Magazine interview where he says, yes, this will be the definitive one for the rest of time, and this will be the definitive origin, <laughs> unchanged, because they know what of a genius I am. And this this was in Time Magazine. You can, you can look it up. <laughs> and us hearing that, it's like, sure, <laughs> no one will ever redo Superman's origin ever again. (laughs) Jeez, that that doesn't sound uh, full of himself at all either. I'm impressed. But so that was, but that was a a restart of the con of the Superman continuity or re retcon and everything. Right. Yeah. Because they had, you know, out with the old and with the new after, you know, crisis on infinite earth. So that was the, you know, big flagship title leading the pack. But normally when they would do something, when they would want to, when they felt the need to have a new number one issue, they didn't always, like, it wasn't that type of, of, of restarting continuity. It was more like, oh, here's a new title, or we're, we're, we're going to just restart JLA, we're renaming it JLA, not Justice League, and here's a new number one, a launching point to go off of. But it wasn't like it was trying to re, 
uh, reconfigure continuity. Nah, because right? like you know, you still had you know a long going series like Action Comics and whatever hundred it is, because that shows a longevity of the comic and a legacy, and you know you want to preserve that. But it just got to a point where it's like, hey, new number ones actually sell better. So like people think they're valuable because it starts that way, but like. You know, you eventually, you know, if you do something a lot, people become desensitized to it. And so, like, can you just give us our legacy back, our longevity? Because, like, guess what? The first comic you read probably wasn't a number one, was it? No. no. You just jumped right in. Of course not. Yeah, and it, you should just, like, have fun with that. Says, right. Oh, this book has been around a while. And so, like, there's the fun of, like, you know, hunting old issues and going back and going back and learning all this history. So yeah. I think that's a fun thing. You don't need the direct jumping on point. You just need the jumping in point. And you say, you, you use the phrase, give us our legacy back. I, I think that's kind of the, the key. There's something psychologically, I'm not, you know, well educated enough in psychology to, to know the specifics, but there's something there in psychologically that when, when a publisher gives you, Matt, a new Superman, you know, and it's a, a, a complete reboot continuity starting over from scratch, there's something subconsciously that tells you, Oh, so my other issue isn't real or part of this or anything like that. There's something where it, it not that it's intended to do so, but it kind of minimizes or tries to delete or forget the history. That's wh- I think that's why they have such a trouble. They, the publisher keeps wanting to relaunch or reboot continuity from scratch because they think it'll be easier to promote comics moving forward without all the continuity, right? But the fans fight it every time it happens. And yeah, I, think- I mean, it's the whole thing of like trying to bring in a new readership <clears throat> versus pushing away the dedicated fans. But and- why? Why are that? Why does? Why did? Why are they? Why do they hold on to that so much? Yeah, for me, you know, my thoughts on the issue. I think they're just trying to. Well, you know, we have all these people going to the movies now and stuff like that. Let's try to reach out. But oftentimes, like the whole thing is. There is not a strong correlation of new readership when you have a big movie come out. And that's, you know, it's really unfortunate. I really wish more people would jump on and start reading comics uh, when they, you know, do big movies and whatnot. But honestly, I would just say cater to your longtime readers, the people who are, you know, supporting you in the long term, the hardcore fans. Those people don't don't burn them. They're the ones going into the comic store every week and buying your issues, buying mm-hmm. your toys, your training cards, your merchandise, you know, sporting it on. The hardcore people are the ones that have established themselves. On. Right. And those people feeling burned because I just feel like they're like, nah, they're just going to restart it. I don't want to read anymore. It's, it's really unfortunate. I think that, that you get this, a similar uh, effect and response from the audience with movies, when you have a reboot rather than a, a kind of a sequel set in continuity. Look at one of the most anticipated movies of the year is Blade Runner 2049. Uh-huh. Not a reboot. It's in continuity. I mean, you can call it a reboot in the perhaps original sense of the word's definition, meaning we're just kind of like a new starting or launching point or relaunch, but it's not a restart from continuity where we're just going to tell the same stupid story again, but with better cameras and digital effects or whatever, you know? The so, something awakens. The what? The something awakens. That's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. I'm not going to touch that one. Um, but yeah, I think of specifically uh, RoboCop and... Um, and especially Ghostbusters. Now, Ghostbusters was so controversial for, you know, other stuff as well. But I think the critical sin that torpedoed that project, that all the bad things from that project sprouted out from, was their idea to say, no, we cannot have these other characters existing in continuity. Because if we do... People will. I think it's fear. They're scared that their that their property can't live on its own feet next to you know the characters that started the franchise or whatever. I think it's a it was a colossal error. And I think that you know this. I think Blade Runner for that specific reason is one of the uh, one of the films that you know takes an old property uh, into the current era and actually looks like it could be doing a really good job of it. Cool. Um, was there anything else you wanted to add in terms of things that you regret missing? 
Uh, yeah, so I, I do regret missing a couple of the panels, the Kirby stuff. Um, I, I, I regretted uh, trying to check in with the, the X-Men, but uh, generally I, I was pretty pleased um, along with Matt. You know, I actually, this was, <laughs> this Comic-Con was probably the most focused for me. I had just launched Hero Journalism as a channel, and so I was really focused on trying to get as many, and I always am, but I just, I just uh, was a little bit more less about the fun this year and a little bit more about the the work fun part of it yeah cool i can definitely uh relate to that <laughs> um i know matt you you mentioned some regrets earlier is there anything else that you wanted to add concerning any regrets from uh, this year's comic-con no <laughs> i have one regret i just remembered i'm gonna quick go before you go to dan um i almost got to interview i think his name is gary stern from Stern Electronics, which was a legendary video game arcade cabinet maker from the 70s and 80s. And they're still around and they're still producing, though, though sort of. I mean, it's the company relaunch has been gone for many years, but it relaunched. They, they relaunched or rebooted? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this one may be a reboot. Uh, uh, <laughs> there's, none of their old games made it to the new company, so um, it's not in continuity. Um, but they're doing pin, they're pinball exclusive now. And I was walking on the con floor, and I walked by this booth that had Star Wars and Star Trek pinball machines set up that you could play. They were there with no quarters needed. They were there to be played by people. And uh, and I'm like, I'm just, I'm like, just getting some B-roll of it. And I'm, I asked this guy, and he's like, Oh yeah, you should stop by tomorrow. Gary Stern will be here. And I'm like. He's from Stern Electronics or whatever. I'm like, oh my god, a guy that was involved in the heyday of, of arcade video games. That was, I so I did come back and I tried to uh, connect with them and I apparently had just missed him. He had left Con the day before or whatever. So I was a little heartbroken about that. But uh. cool, Alex, you have anything uh, you want to add to the regrets? Um, like everyone else, it's just panels. Um, <laughs> A lot of it's just because not enough time to see all the ones I wanted to, but there's a few that I missed because other reasons like um, a lot of the image co-founders and their original studios had panels. Rob Liefeld with, with Extreme, right. uh, Mark Silvestri with Top Cow, Jim Lee with Wild, Wild Storm. Uh, they all had panels, and I didn't get a chance to check any of them out. So, And they, well, they had a Wild Storm reunion at the San Diego Comic Art Gallery, which... That would have been pretty cool to see because there's a lot of talented artists that showed up, a bunch of them. A couple a lot of people showed up. <laughs> Over a thousand. Wow. Wow. TJ said, like, and you know, he showed up in the morning, there were 300 people lined up already. Like, Holy geez. moly. <laughs> What's the capacity in that joint? Not, Not a thousand. Maybe a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's crazy. Maybe even so, less because no, of the table by, setups. It was a pretty popping spot. Wow. Yeah. We'll, we'll say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that would have been cool to see because there's a lot of talented artists. But I was like, that's basically it. Just a lot of panels that with time overlaps and other other um, priorities that I had to take care of. Hey Matt, would you want to elaborate a little bit about the Wall Street party? No, I think we'll just leave it. At, it was a popping spot. <laughs> <laughs> you had to be there. Yeah. Um, okay, um, we'll just go, go to the next topic. Uh, trends that we noticed at this year's Comic Con. Um, what? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I guess one trend I kind of noticed was a um, lot less cosplay. I mean, there's a lot, but not as much as you know previous years. I don't know if it was the weather and the humidity that. Cause people not to dress up, but weather was a pretty decent. Actually, the weather was pretty great. I thought. I mean, if you weren't stuck out in the sun uh -huh. too much directly, yeah. I thought it was a pretty comfortable con. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't know. For some reason, to me, just cosplay just seems a lot less. Yeah, I, I agree. Though yeah. I didn't, it didn't strike me as much as it it normally did. Yeah, cosplay was definitely diminished in form. Like you know, that's one thing I noticed. I wish there was a little more of it, but uh, you know, the thing about San Diego is it's you know. Cosplayers will, you know, typically go, like, a lot of times just, you know, see, like, certain photographers and stuff. And it's really hard to track down photographers at San Diego because of how hectic it is. Mm -hmm. And they don't have really, like, a designated location because it's like you got to keep people moving, you got to keep people going. If you're, like, 
at Long Beach Comic Con, photographers will always be right up front over at the side of the quad and just like hang out about. And it's a little more difficult with that during San Diego Comic Con, so it's definitely hard to. Hey, what did you cosplay as? I did not cosplay. Oh, you did not this year? Nope, I've never cosplayed at San Diego. Oh, okay. You only do it at other cons? Yeah. I, I rarely do it at cons. They're usually at cosplay exclusive events. Oh, okay, okay. We'll talk about uh, your upcoming appearances on, on the Flash Forward segments of this podcast. Right. <laughs> um, I guess uh, some trends that I sort of noticed was the rise of the indie creators. Um, proof positive would be some of the people that we've had on the podcast. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, Jason Inman and Ashley Robinson with their Jupiter Jet comic book. You got Keith and Jones with uh, Par Nights and uh, the rest of the comic books under his uh, uh, Kid Comics umbrella. Um, you know, David Pose, um, you know, Stefan Frank. It's just cool seeing all of these indie creators um, doing a lot of the, you know, some, some cool work. And, and I'm, I'm all for that. And it fits into the vibe of what we're trying to do here at, uh, at Hall H and the Hall H uh, Show podcast. Um, it seems like digital comics is uh, starting to sort of branch out with other people trying to do them with Hoopla. Uh, I want to look more into what Hoopla has to offer. Um, and I think Alex mentioned this earlier, um, you know, Comic-Con, it's, it's Comic-Con International, right? So it was kind of cool um, seeing a few booths in there from other countries. Uh, he mentioned Russia, China, there's some South American countries. So next year, I think what I'm going to try to do, or what we're going to try to do is kind of focus on the international aspect of, of Comic-Con. So uh, Dan, uh, what were some of the trends that you noticed? Um, is lines considered a trend? Sure. Because there was lines everywhere. Uh-huh. Yeah, on site, off site. Like I think the Game of Thrones at one point turned into like a twelve hour line for some people. Mm-hmm. Um, the Funko pop up shop. Which which for for which Game of Thrones thing? The off site. Oh, the off site. Gotcha. The, the one yeah. next the one next to the Omni, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 The Funko pop up shop. People started lining up on Tuesday for it opening on Thursday. So it was just lines what? no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> Tons of off site lines. Did you hear about the um, altercation at the Game of Thrones signing on the floor? I did not. Did you, anyone hear about that? Not me. I had this or Please enlighten me. My buddy, well, <laughs> my buddies that I had gone to con with um, were walking down the aisle when it was happening. And apparently, so at the booth, the cast, you know, comes and they're like behind a table or something and they're doing a signing. There's a line for it. Immediately, bedlam. It's craziness. That was one of the interesting trends I noticed was Game of Thrones was the it property this year. Right? I mean, <clears throat> I mean, it surprised me because... Yeah, because, I mean, you know, it's been around for a while, but it's like it didn't have a big thing to compete this year. So everyone's like, okay. But also, I think the show has just reached critical mass. I mean, it, you know, it's been growing. Yeah. And now it's become... I mean, it's always been a very cool show, and a lot of people have liked it, but I think it's becoming so, you know, so much... Uh, so many more people are watching it. I mean, I was shocked that that was the it costume was the dragon mama. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you know, so um, anyways, they they come out and the place goes nuts. And apparently everybody in the aisle like stopped to to look, which, you know, that is going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. And the security people were, you know, upset. And uh, and my friends saw one guy who wasn't even stopped. He pulled out his phone, and as he was walking, he started recording the, the people doing the autographs, and now things were getting a little hectic there, and so there may be some re other stuff that had happened, but not with this guy, I guess. He got his phone slapped out of his hand. He got his phone slapped out of his hand. Out. Yeah, that's, um, you know, unless you did something specifically demonstrably wrong or illegal that's pretty that's pretty surprising so and like i said they they my friends were pretty shocked because they said he wasn't even stopped i mean he was standing in the aisle but he was walking as he was doing it and i mean that's just that, that's uncalled for it now but apparently there was a lot of craziness going on and they might have been reacting partially because of uh you know some pushing or shoving from other people or something i don't know but but it was, 
it was pretty interesting. Game of Thrones, definitely a trend. Cool. Uh, Matt, do you have any trends that you, you noticed at this year's Comic-Con? Everyone was there. Everyone got in. And, you know, you didn't... You know, I, I honestly feel like there wasn't... The, the trend at this year's Comic-Con is when you look on Comic-Con outside, there wasn't a whole lot of people complaining about not being there. Because there's always, you know, the people, I wish I was at Comic-Con, everyone's there but me. But, like, those people who usually complain have just finally, you know, found Nerdy Graw. They're finally, like, in the mix of things. Right. And so, like, yeah, they know. It's like, now you have no right to complain because, yeah, there's something for you to do even if you... If you if you if you ain't inside, mm -hmm. in fact, a lot of the people on the inside were going out to the you know outside events, and so that's you know they had a fun time there. So it's like there's no reason for you to complain if you're in San Diego. There is something for you to do. Exactly. Yeah, they even extended the the street blockage down like one more block down uh, Fifth Avenue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's just how it be. All right. Well. I guess we'll go ahead and do a quick thunder round um, just to uh, do our little off the beam path set of questions. Uh, we'll start off with Matt. Mm -hmm. uh, when was your first San Diego Comic Con and uh, what do you remember from it? It was 1994. And I was watching the X Men cartoon and the episode had just you know gone to a commercial break. They're saying, come to the San Diego Comic Con. I'm like, Dad, that looks like the coolest thing in the entire world. That was the, and, and we went down. How old were you in 1994? I was eight. Oh, oh yeah, and I was just you know mesmerized by the Comic Con. I just had like this phenomenal time. It just was <laughs> just the most life changing experience. And now like just like you know we bought passes to Hale. We parked down there. We gave our passes away at the end of the day because we weren't really going to use them. But it was like a really inspiring inspiring time for me. I even re met John Romita Senior that day and didn't even know it was him. So like you know, I was getting my uncut sheet of like 1994 Spider Man trading cards. So. How'd was, you find out it was him then? When I found it a couple of years ago, and John Ramit just seen. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that was. Uh, <laughs> it was his autograph. That's how you identified yeah, who it was years later. <laughs> it's so funny. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I guess we'll just go down the, the list of questions and let uh, Matt answer all of them um, yeah, just for now, just because... Uh, yeah, because I sadly have to wrap soon. No so, worries, no worries. Busy man. Uh, you mentioned some pro tips for Comic-Con. What what's one good pro tip that you can share with audience? Sleep. Audiences? Number one most important thing is sleep. Because if you are not well rested for this event, you will be groggy, you will be tired, you will be hating yourself, and you just won't have a good time at the con. One of the nights, I actually did not get a good night's of sleep. And yeah, it, yeah, it sounds like it. You said yeah. 4 a.m., I think, didn't you? Oh, well, that was the last day. I mean, I didn't show up till 1 p.m. that on <laughs> Sunday. Because, I mean, I, uh, so I was pretty... Slept was pretty in busy. Sunday, huh? Yeah, but uh, Thursday night, I just like... It was one of those, like... It's the first day where, like, anything that can go wrong will go wrong kind of days. And so, like, that was kind of it. And just, like, you know, do your own thing, have a good time. And I was just having a, just having a blast. But, yeah, just be well-rested for it because it's a pretty intimidating event. Cool. Um, you're hanging out at the Odyssey Lounge at the Hilton Bayfront. Out of all the people that attended this year, uh, who or what group of people would you want to have a drink with, and what would you talk about? Well, I think I got the kind of crew I wanted this year because we had a wonderful crew of, uh, you know, like you know, my best friend Dax was there. A lot of local cosplayers showed up for the uh, Odyssey Lounge, and then La Bamba from Conan O'Brien, uh, who's in Conan's band, he showed up too. We we're having a drink with La Bamba, and that was just that was just awesome. I just had such a wonderful crew there this year at the Odyssey Lounge. I was just having a blast. Cool. Uh, most of us here probably wouldn't wait in line for a whole day for a Hall H panel. Um, but is there anything you would want to wait in line for? Um, it could be both Comic-Con or non-Comic-Con related. Only thing I'd probably wait in line all day for is a Steve Ditko autograph. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would never happen, but I mean, it would be an all-day event, and I think I could uh, make do with that. <laughs> cool. Uh, what four people would uh, you put on a comic book culture-themed Mount Rushmore? What would I do? I would definitely do Wally Wood, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, and Devil Dinosaur. <laughs> I did the uh, Wally Wood panel at Con this year. Oh, 
Good. Yeah. Well, he's a genius. He cool. is. He was. Um, I, know, I know that you have to run, but uh, can you just briefly let us know where you're going to be at uh, in the immediate future and where people can find you? Oh, where am I going to be in the immediate future? Well, you can find me posting on Facebook every two seconds at Matt Dunford, but uh, I will have a very busy August with a lot of events. So coming up on the 12th and 13th, I will be here in San Diego at uh, my favorite event, Tiki Oasis. It's a fun event where you basically are just given a bunch of just uh, tiki drinks nonstop. So just, you know, show up in a Hawaiian shirt and some sandals and shorts. Just have fun at the ultimate pool party. Kick back, relax, and just have a blast. And uh, this year, it's secret agent themed. It's like, a, you know, it, every it's a big 60s style tiki party, and there's so much fun. The first year I went, I was like, you know what, I'm... <clears throat> Like, I'm just going to show up for an hour. And then I didn't end up leaving till four in the morning. <coughs> it was that much fun. And then the following week, uh, the dates of uh, the 19th and 20th, I will be at the Pokemon World Championships in Anaheim. Wow. So, yeah. And then the following week after that, I've got Poke Oasis up underneath the Oceanside Pier, which I will be hosting. And so it's a Pokemon fandom event put on by VGC, that's Video Game Connection, my friend Pablo Torres, and it's going to be a whole lot of fun. So I highly recommend attending these events because they're just an absolute blast, and I just have a wonderful time at them. Cool. And where, where can people find you online? Just Matt Dunford at, uh, at Facebook.com or like at Matt Dunford at Instagram. You can also do at Matt Dunford on Twitter, but I never really use Twitter because it just gets hacked by porn bots all the time. So, yeah, sure. <laughs> Unless you feel like giving up uh, me your social security number. I mean, that's, that's why. <laughs> well, thanks for being on the show. And I know you got to run, but uh, we'll definitely uh, hook up again some other time. All right. Thank you so much, guys. I do appreciate it. Always good to see you, Matt. See you, Matt. All right. Yeah. See you, Matt. I guess we will go back to the, <laughs> the beginning of the Thunder Round, and uh, we'll go to Dan. Uh, when was your first Samuel Comic Con, and uh, do you remember anything from it? Um, I think it was 93 only because I still have the souvenir book at home, and, <laughs> and I don't remember anything about it. Jason? Uh, my first year was 2000, I think. It's possible it could have been 2001. I had moved to San Diego the fall of 99, and so I can't remember. But I'm pretty, I bet it would have been 2000, um, and I bet I can, if I do a little research, I can probably figure it out by figuring out when Spider-Man and X-Men came out, because I, I know I was there when Sam Raimi came down uh, with footage from, you know, the shooting of Spider-Man. That was such a huge event. But I will never forget the exact first moment I stepped onto the con floor. It was one of the most amazing feelings. I walked through those doors and... I just had this smile that, you know, grew from ear to ear. And, and I just, I mean, having loved comic books ever since I, and superheroes ever since I was a little kid, and having that always been kind of a fringe, you know, looked down upon thing, to be at this huge event where thousands of people we're all, you know, there sharing the same love. I mean, I felt like I could walk up to any person and just start talking comics with them and hang out and laugh and joke and all that stuff. I mean, you just felt this simpatico in the room that, you know, of course, if you go back further in time, it's just, it's so hard to, I think, completely convey to younger generations how how different it is with with nerd culture being so embraced these days i mean it's a great thing but it's because <clears throat> i had so much experience of that not being the case back when i was a kid when i remember walking in and i was just like oh i'm home i mean it was it was just i'll never forget that moment definitely cool alex um i don't remember the exact year but it was early early 90s and i don't think i went there Legitly, was like sneaking in. <laughs> nice. I think it was maybe late nineties when I started paying to go. <laughs> That's why Trump said he's building a wall around Comic Con. Stop people like you from sneaking in. <laughs> That's when you could sneak in. Now it's real tough. <laughs> I think for me it was probably nineteen ninety five, 
And uh, you know, the reason why I included this question, you know, on, on this podcast was obviously we just had Sango Comic Con, but uh, as, as you know, I was talking to Matt earlier, I, I saw him last week uh, when uh, Leonard, uh, you know, Englishman in San Diego was still in town. We met up at the uh, uh, the Comic Art Gallery in Liberty Station. I uh, hung out with TJ uh, Sheldon. He runs the place over there. So yeah, if you guys ever go down there, um, say what's up to TJ. He'll you know he's really knowledgeable and he can talk your off about comic books. But uh, outside, you know, before you walk into the gallery, they have a Wildstorm poster from 1995. You know, and it's like it's like huge. It's like you know, I don't know, eight feet maybe by whatever. Um, but that poster is still in my old room at my parents' house. It's still hanging. And I was reminded um, that I got that like at my first Comic Con. I think it was 1995. Um, props to my friend Salim, uh, Salim Crawford. I think he was working as, a, as an inker for Image at the time and got me tickets. So, um, yeah. So that's my fondest, my first memory of my first Comic Con was getting that poster at, uh, I think it was 1995. Did you just go and buy it or what? Well, I, I didn't know it was going to be there. Was it a giveaway? Uh, I think it was a giveaway. I, I can't remember an exactly. Eight foot poster? Yeah. It was Dang. Pretty, I, I've seen someone just. I think someone just, I saw on Instagram, someone just bought one online for like 40 bucks. Yeah. It was pretty, pretty big size. Yeah. Close so I think, nice. I think even Jack Kirby contributed to it or somebody, wow. somebody put one of Jack Kirby's characters in there. And cause I think that's the year that he died, I believe. Or previous. What year did you say? It was, it was like 95, I think. 94. 94. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right yeah. Around that time. So they, but they put his name at, and you know, uh, I guess as in, so to pay the respects for, to Jack Kirby. Um, Tips, um, Matt. Oh, you know, you're right. It might have been 95. Yeah. He died either one of those two years. Yeah. Right. That. Sorry, sorry. So uh, well. Matt, Matt Dunford had a pretty good tip, but uh, sleep. Oh, yeah. Um, I, guess, I guess I'll lead off this, this question. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take one of Alex's tips. <laughs> he brings tennis balls uh, to, to the cons because at the end of the day, it's pretty good to use on your feet. To sort of you know the, the the roundness of the ball sort of like massages your 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 the bottom of your feet, so I think that's a pretty good pro tip to bring tennis balls because uh, those help. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Alex, I stole your <laughs> no, tip. No, no, no. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, you can go next, Alex. <clears throat> uh, tip uh, like Matt sleep. Uh, there was one night where I went to bed pretty late too and just ruined the whole morning the next day. So it kind of almost rested the con, but yeah, sleep, get sleep. Um, another different one would probably be um i think we talked just about our our preview podcast is just yeah. planning and uh what i got from stephanie gray from sec fit was able to swerve she said swerve so that means if you plan something and something comes up you're able to adjust to different different things that come up and uh just work with it and like she says swerve yeah, or be, adjust to adapt. You that, was, that, was a, that was a good yeah. tip from Stephanie. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dan? Um, stay hydrated and have at least two pairs of shoes. Oh, yeah. 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 Two pairs of shoes? Yeah, yeah. alternate days. <laughs> exactly. Because uh-huh. if you're walking all day, your feet actually, you could lose a, like a pint of water through your feet just from sweating through your feet. Yeah, so just and, have a dip, alternate yeah. shoes. Oh, uh-huh. she have extra pair of shoes yeah. for the sweating issue? Yeah, I mean, yeah. so you could rotate, exactly. alternate oh, days, okay. Okay. let it dry okay. out. Because gotcha. that's gotcha. what a lot of runners, serious runners, they have a couple pairs of shoes that they could rotate. Because, you know, if they run every day, their shoes are going to get, you know, sweaty and wet. So I, you, I, guess, I guess you better <laughs> bring some Febreze, too. <laughs> 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 All right. How about you, Jason? You got a pro tip? Not, no, I, I don't. I, you know, I, my pro tip is go. Just do it. Just do it. Shia LaBeouf, do it. What are you waiting for? <laughs> um, you know, dive in. Uh, you know, um, you know uh, grab life by the testes uh, or the con by the testes. Um, you know, um, someone asked me how I got to interview Tawny Katan, Katan, um, at the con, and uh, and I wasn't going to. She was there. Now, for any listeners that don't recognize the name, she was a sex symbol from the '80s and '90s, known primarily from the early Tom Hanks, you know, uh, hit film Bachelor Party. Um, but also, she was married to David Coverdale, the lead singer of White Snake, and 
was often featured in the White Snake videos and very sexily and, and often uh, dancing or writhing on the top of a pair of twin jaguars. So, you know, that leaves an impression, especially if you're 13 years old. So anyways, uh, <laughs> I saw her at the uh, uh, autograph area. You, you didn't have a Kurt Busiek moment, did you? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, you know, she's got a little rep, okay? I don't know if you followed her, but, you know, she's had a few moments in the tabloids for, you know, dis- you know, she got into a dispute with one of her husbands, and I won't go into that, but... So actually, she might, you know, she was the opposite. She was uh, very nice and charming. Uh, now, but I didn't know to expect that, and I was in the autograph alley area, and um, and I didn't think she'd really be, you know, go for it. And I didn't really know that I had that much to say, but I definitely wanted to touch on it. I wanted to touch uh, that topic that she was there. So I was doing a stand-up you know, of myself walking through. Now this is, you know, I, I got a, uh, a selfie stick this year. And so I was actually selfie sticking myself doing a stand uh, uh, talking about autograph alley. And I had the camera angled. So the people were behind me and I'd walk down the aisle and there'd be a different person in front of me. I'd slow down and talk a little bit about, about them or whatever. Well, I did that for her. I did that for a couple people at the um, Autograph Alley. And that night when I was dumping my footage to my computer, I was looking at the footage and I noticed (laughs) when I walked past her, when I started to walk past her spot in Autograph Alley, she turned to me and she stood up and she blew kisses in my direction. And kind of like, hey, why, why aren't you, you know, uh-huh. coming up and, and sticking the mic in my face or something? And so I saw that and I'm like, oh, my God, tomorrow I'm going to go up and I'm going to ask her for an interview. And so I did. And, uh-huh. you know, she, there weren't anybody waiting at the time. She said, sure. And and uh, just had a, a, a brief chat with her to talk about some of the different things she's done and, and what people remember her from at Con. Apparently it's a... She gets a wide variety of, of you know, her t- well, her top, you know, five, six things, but it's not just the bachelor party or, or the white snake videos or whatever. So, so, and that was all just for saying, well, to heck with it. I didn't think it, it was really likely, but I just walked up and asked her and it worked. So do it, yeah. Shia LaBeouf style, do it. Just take a chance. Yes, exactly. That's right. That's a good tip. Um, all right. Uh, you're hanging out at the Odyssey Lounge at the Hilton Bayfront. Um, out of all the people that attended this year, who or what group of people would you want to have a drink with and what would you talk about? Boy, Mike Royer would be a, a fun one. Um, <laughs> That's especially, my pick, too. <laughs> since you put me on the spot, that, that just, I mean, he's such a character. But, you know, you're saying, you're, you're saying about people that I know were there, and, of course, most of the people I know were there were people I saw. I'm sure there was probably some cool ones that I didn't see or was unaware of that they were there but you know Paul Dini I would love to have followed up you know that question with a, a cocktail at the Bayfront and and you know really get into that topic in depth because he's a cartoon nerd like I am too and so um, you know whereas at his panel it was you know more about Harley and not cartoons per se even though there's a lot of more modern cartoon fans there but I mean Paul Dini cut his teeth, you know, writing episodes of like He-Man and stuff. And, you know, so he, he, you know, he's, uh, uh, he knows a little bit about cartoon history and the weaknesses and strengths of the industry, especially the weaknesses in the earlier historical days. So um, I would have loved to have uh, had a chance to talk about that concept of original characters and what those writers contribute or, or sometimes don't contribute by uh, by those characters. Yeah, that'd, and be, such. that'd be appropriate subject matter for what you, what you're doing on here with journalism. Yes, yes, yes. That would be that's that's why as soon as you mentioned it, I thought that would be definitely one of the top options for me. Cool, Dan. How about you? Um, probably most of the cast of Spunk on Valley was here. So T.J. Miller, Coop Milne, and, and John Zach Woods. Mm-hmm. Cool. cool, awesome. Is there anything that you want to ask him, or just hang it on general? Just yeah, kind of talk about the show and yeah. Cool. How about you, Alex? Uh, my first choice was Mike Warrior, but since Jason picked it, <laughs> 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 uh, that would have been that would have been real fun. But one 
um, person that comes to mind just from his Instagram feed is uh, Todd Nock. Oh, yeah, Coming yeah. Regarded. He looks like a real fun guy to, yeah. to probably, you know, have a drink and hang out with. And yeah, we had a good time just interacting with him a little bit at uh, Comic Con Revolution. Yeah. 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 So that that cool. would that'd be pretty interesting to see how he interacts with a few drinks. <laughs> nice. Um, I mentioned uh, Arlen Schumer earlier, and he's definitely somebody that I'd want to, you know, sling back a few drinks and just, you know, hear what he has to say because he's really knowledgeable about a lot of things. Um, so he'd be one person. Uh, I'm not sure what I'd, you know, want to ask him in particular. I just let him just, <laughs> just let him go and then talk with about whatever. Geez. Sure, Salkowitz would be a yeah, really exactly. good one. And too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He'd, he'd, he'd be in my short list. Do you know who Jerry Beck is? No. I just, I know it's a little non sequitur, but you just that what you're talking about reminded me of him. He's uh, he does a uh, website called Cartoon Research or Cartoon Brew. I can't remember which, but he's a regular at Comic Con. One of his panels that I think was done every year. I don't know if they still do it. I think they do. Is the world's worst cartoons or whatever? <laughs> but he's a he's an animation historian, an expert. But I thought you might have uh, you might be familiar with him. I ran into him in the uh, just in the hallway, and uh, I've talked to him a few times. But I mean, he didn't know who I was or anything. But we we had a l- little you nice. know, brief chat. I'll, I'll, I'll look him up later. Yeah, yeah. World's worst cartoon. <laughs> Pardon? Is that like oh too yeah, mu- like too much coffee, man? <laughs> 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 Not at all. That's great. Um, I actually I have uh, a DVD I bought from his website on that because a lot of the uh, cartoons are like public domain, and so he put together a website on mm. it. Um, and it's 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 fascinating. I mean, yeah, some of, they're really bad, but um, it's it's really. Fa- I definitely get interested in the historical aspect of it and. When you're talking about the worst, a lot of times you're talking about technically the worst, and so for that you kind of you start to go back a little bit in history when you know things were a lot more simpler, and then even then the technical elements really mm-hmm. were a fail or whatever. But yeah, <laughs> it's it's good if you uh, want to talk about that sometime, Alex. Uh, I'll bring in the DVD. Yeah, yeah. Be cool. Um, now I guess for me, uh, well, it's just to sort of elaborate on people that I'd want to have a conversation with at the, at the bar, um, I didn't get a chance to really hang out with a lot of uh, SDCC Fit family. I, we didn't really have a formal like meetup, so it'd be kind of cool to get a, a lot more of us together just because um, our community is growing and I, I want to meet as much, you know, as many of them as possible just to sort of, you know, get their ideas, you know, their, you know what, they're, what, they're up, what they're up to, keep in touch with them, make sure they're, I guess, you know, on track to reach whatever goals that they're they're trying to do, uh, because you know being fit for Comic Con uh, does you know sort of help you in the long run have a better experience at the Comic Con just yep. because that's just you know you, you take care of like you can go up the stairs you know pretty easily you can go from panel to panel pretty easily without getting winded um, you know walking is such a big proponent of at a con especially if you go to a lot of cons so I think it's important for us to sort of, you know, we, we've, we've made a lot of progress in the last two years, but uh, there's still a lot, you know, to do. Um, I think, I forgot to mention this earlier, but besides the, the other items on my trend list, I think nerd fitness is a trend that's growing. Uh, you got you have the, the people from Nerd Strong. They have panels themselves uh, at different conventions. So it'd be kind of cool to sort of gal- help further galvanize the SDCC Fit movement with a little meetup. Um, nice. uh, yeah, so um, the next question. Uh, most of us here probably wouldn't wait in line for a whole day uh, for <laughs> something at Hall H. Um, is there something that you'd want to, you know, wait in line for? Jason? Um, for me, it would probably have to be... I mean, I've, I've always thought it would be fun to go to Hall H, but I would... I, I'm not interested in it. I mean, I am. I'm. It's the the stuff that's they're covering is my bread and butter, but um, it's just not worth the commitment of the con. I mean, it's just too much of the con, and for stuff that you're just basically going to be able to get video of online anyways. For a fan, I can see it because you're there in person, and if that is uh, enhances the experience, I. I'm that I'm totally I you know I'm not trying to minimize that I'm saying when when I'm going there I want information and and what can I do to 
how will this comment that, you know, Ryan Reynolds says about Deadpool or Harrison Ford said about 2049 Blade Runner, how are these uh, going to fit into the context of what they are and, and the criticism of them? And so technically, I don't need to be there. In fact, if there was a way to just strap eye cameras into Dan's eyes and have him record everything that he does at the con, maybe I would just stay home and then download the footage from his <laughs> eyes every night and cut my documentaries together off of that. No, I mean, it's fun to be there too, but, but uh, Hall H is just, uh, it's just not, not needed for me. For me, it would probably be something I would wait all in line for or all day in line for would be like a one-on-one -on -one interview with like a Mike Royer or definitely one of the old greats, even a Paul Dini, even though I, you know, consider him a more modern guy. I mean, not totally. He's a big '90s guy, but uh, uh, that—that's the type of thing that I would wait in line for. Cool, Dan. I would not wait in line for anything. <laughs> <laughs> I would lose too much seeing the other stuff. This is the third straight year since Hall H opened that I didn't step into it. Yeah, I was there from when it first year. I think was 2007 or six, and every year I've gone till 2014 and just haven't stepped foot. Just give, would give up too much of my day to. Yeah. Exactly. Get in a hall age when you can see the footage online or at D23 the week before for some of it. Right. Cool. Alex? Um, I don't know. Probably if I had to, um, probably would be a hall age event. I don't know. Some probably a Saturday panel where like the biggest um, primetime movie or TV show is going to be showing up. But if anything, that would probably be it. Mm. Just for the experience. Cool. I mean, the only thing I'd probably wait for at Comic-Con is if, if Radiohead had a panel, I'd probably wait for that. <laughs> That's probably the only thing. Um, now, which four people would you want to put on a comic book culture-themed Mount Rushmore? <coughs> and I guess you could do, since, since Matt put Devil Dinosaur in there, you can mix it up or have it all fictional. It's, <laughs> it's up to you guys. Uh, Jason? Um... If I'm reading the question right, you got to have like Jack Kirby, yep. Stan Lee, and then uh, and then it gets a little tough. Um, I'm assuming I would have to have Simon Siegel and Schuster, one of those guys, maybe two of those guys. You'd think almost maybe one to represent Superman and. Uh, uh, so, but, but, or you could just do those four, maybe Siegel and Schuster and Kirby, Lee and Kirby, that, that would be a possibility. Um, it, it, boy, that's tough to be put on the spot to try and argue because you, you know, you're, you try to think about who, yeah. who deserves it more or whatever. Um, you know, Siegel and Schuster are so important, but it's like, uh, you know, I, I haven't read much of their work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not trying to be a, a jerk or whatever, but um, but I, boy, I think you'd have to go with those guys. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, Dan, Bill Finger for sure. Ah, uh, you stole Ooh. mine. I was gonna put that guy. <laughs> nice. I, was, I, was, I was gonna put Bill Finger. Yeah, Bill Finger, Kirby, Bill Finger over Bob Kane. Heck yeah. Yes, <laughs> in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, Finger, um, Kirby, probably R Ramita Senior. And that would the fourth one be Stanley. Okay, cool. Alex? As, like, it's hard to narrow it down, but yeah, Jack Kirby, probably Stanley. Um, I don't know, I'll probably put Neil Adams just for his contributions to the, um, the artist side of, of comics and maybe the image logo, just because how they kind of revamped the modern, you know, publishing process for artists and creators well it, yeah it's, it's it's interesting you, you picked Neil Adams just because um, you know the, the visual lectures by Arlen Schumer he, he sometimes pairs up his visual lecture of Neil Adams and, and Jack Kirby just because that's sort of the juxtaposition of their two styles one of them is like hyper exaggerated one's more realistic so but they're both like Silver Age artists so mm -hmm. it's just interesting um, for me, I would pick, uh, of course, Kirby, um, Bill Finger, <laughs> uh, Stanley, 
And I don't know much about Will Eisner, but it seems like um, I, I mentioned Stefan Frank earlier. And in my interview with him, he mentions Will Eisner being a in, big influence, the spirit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, being a big oh, yeah. influence on, on you know, uh, when he was, you know, younger. It's one of the top names I hear yeah. other than Kirby. Right, right. Uh, so, is uh, among yeah. comics pros saying mm-hmm. who their inspirations were was Eisner. Yeah, so I guess, I guess that would be my, my four. Yeah, okay. if you got an award named after you, you must be yeah, right. big, right? The comic book Oscars <laughs> are named Eisner's. That should tell us something, yeah. shouldn't it? <laughs> I guess we can start uh, wrapping up the show. Um, I guess I want to touch on this a little bit, um, on, on maybe things that uh, Comic-Con can improve upon for next year. Um, do you guys have any suggestions? We'll start with Jason. No, um, I, I do have one uh, anecdote, one thing I saw happen. Um, on Thursday, I think it was, we got there and we were in... Now, Hall H refers to that whole building, right? Because that's, don't they uh, label the buildings by, like, you know, the entrances, A, B, C, D, and all that? Uh So I don't don't mean Hall H where the panel is, but so I go into that building. So we're on the the east side of the convention center, and we're going up the escalator, and my buddies immediately went to, like, in the direction of room 25, and I went towards... Uh, at the top of the escalator, you're already at Ballroom 20, kind of, and I started walking towards that to go across to the sales pavilion. Mm. And I got maybe 30 feet from the uh, uh, from the escalator, and I was stuck in a crowd of people, and no one was moving. And it wasn't a line. There was We were in the middle. It's that big open area. Yeah. Uh, it's where you ballroom twenty in a sales pavilion, right, okay. right, and there's always like some food stuff yeah. set up there and everything. Right. Okay, right. and and but I was on the street side of it, mm-hmm. and I was trying to go to the first door, um, and um, so we're stuck there, and we're literally stuck. Now it wasn't so bad that no one was being crushed or physically in danger, but you could sense the crowd was starting to get upset because it had been kind of already stuck before I got there. When I was there, it it lasted for 10 to 20 minutes. 10 to 20 minutes of just standing there not knowing if you're ever going to move or get to anywhere. I mean, it was really frustrating. Suddenly, this guy, this big guy, starts just pushing his way through the crowd. And the first thing you think of is, oh, this jerk just is like fed up with it and wants himself to get out but within a a fraction of a second i heard him say let me through i'll see if i can get this moving and it was someone had alerted a staff the guy swam through the crowd to get to the front it did take him a few minutes to do it but suddenly it was moving again and it still took me several couple minutes just to get from my spot to the door because we there's still so many people there Uh but then i noticed the next day so like friday or saturday i'm i'm there and i go up the escalator and i go to that area and of course it's you know just a normal con day now and in fact it was very sparse and open But suddenly I noticed they had rope lines to that door. And the rope lines followed the wall and the corners. So you had to funnel into the rope line to do it. You couldn't just have everybody trying to funnel to the door. And boom. And I'm like, I'm like, it just, it clicked in me. I'm like, this is why Comic-Con rocks is because it's a well-run con. And they are trying to do what they can and work hard at it to minimize the downsides of the comic going experience, comic con going experience. And, and I, I just felt like it was in real time, an example of just great con management. So I know you're asking for an improvement. This is more of an anecdote of something that they already were doing good. So that's, that's my story. Cool. Dan. Oh, well, it didn't affect me at all. I heard line management was not that great. Yeah. This yeah. Year was kind what of was not that great? Line management. Like one day, there was um, outside the sales pavilion where they let everybody up. One of the security guards accidentally let the wrong group in. So the people who just got there were the first ones. And it's supposed to be people who have been waiting there since 4 p.m. the night before. Wow. Yeah, and also there was, I don't know if you guys heard about it, the um, Hall H. The fake Hall H yeah. wristbands. Is that what you were going to say, or were you going to say something different? The fake Hall H wristbands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which there turned out to be, I think, like 400 counterfeit wristbands. So Ooh. anybody who had one, or anybody who had a wristband but didn't get into Hall H that day, we were given a 
free pass for next year, four day plus preview night, oh, which nice. is kind of cool on Comic Con's end. Oh, yeah. that definitely goes a, a, a good way to try and make up for that because I know people were livid. Yeah, like they had guaranteed because if you have a wristband, you're guaranteed a spot in, but because of some counterfeits wristbands that were allegedly put out there, and not everybody got in. My uh, a good buddy of mine uh, who's also a YouTube uh, uh, broadcaster. Uh, mundane Matt, he his deal every year was Hall H. It dominated his, and he was he's from San Diego, so he's been going to con longer than I have, I believe. Well, maybe not. He's a little younger than I am. Um, anyways, he said this year decided it from now on. He is done with Hall H. He will never do it again. And that he was already down on it from the lines, and and I think. Uh, just the difficulty of them last year, but with this counterfeit wrist badge or wristband thing, yeah, he said he's totally done with it. Alex, um, I think it, yeah, I was line. I think I was in line with my nieces to get some autograph wristbands from the CW line, and um, I think it was they, they could have made the ADA. You know, they have volunteers, volunteer proxies to stand in line for uh, ADA people. And they put the ADA people kind of away from the entrance where they could, uh, you know, stage them right by the table where, where they were picking um, raffle tickets for the wristbands. So they could have made that a little bit more efficient. Um, another thing was getting from outside and going to uh, inside the co um, co convention was... They could have narrowed the lines maybe one or two f people wide instead of just a whole group bum rushing the door to get up the elevator first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, the every I think it was uh, every everything else line, and it was like you know ten people wide the line. And when the doors open, a lot of people not totally crushed, but they're getting getting smashed a little bit, especially the little kids. Uh, they could have. Narrow down the lines a little bit mm -hmm. when they when they get into the doors, and uh, I think the everything else line also in the morning when you when the line um, backs up all the way to the outside to behind the convention center, there's a mad scramble to go to the right line, the CW line, the Funko line, and there's so many people there it's hard to see the signs, and they got to make that a little more clear on which direction they'll go because. I see a lot of parties got that got separated because it was hard to tell which which way to left or right to go to um and everyone saw bum rushing to to get to the right one so you got to make it a little more clear on um each specific funko cw you know hasbro line cool i think uh i, I would recommend people uh hear um our, our good friend leonard uh sultana englishman in san diego he was at the talkback panel and he recorded it and it's on his uh, SoundCloud. So um, if you guys want to hear uh, the talkback panels where they, you know, the, the public gets to sort of voice uh, their opinion. And um, it, it, was a, it was a pretty passionate uh, <laughs> uh, talkback panel. But the gist of it for me was I think there was issues with security, this, whatever, you know, security uh, uh, company that they're using. You know, I, yeah, there were several reports this year that yeah. I heard. I mean, I'm not uh, all comprehensive, but it's, yeah. it's, it's from different types of friends and groups. You, mm -hmm. I heard, you know, so you, you just, you can't blame it on one person that was maybe a jerk to a security guy and right. there's something, it does sound like maybe they had uh, just not as good a training this year for the new staffers. Right, and Dan brought up line management. And I guess generally speaking, there's probably just problems with a, a clear chain of command. You know, when when issues sort of escalate, there was no really uh, direct line of recourse to solve problems. It seems, so in, in certain situations. So yeah, uh, check out the talkback panel that Leonard recorded. It's pretty enlightening. Um, I guess it's time for the uh, the old uh, flash forward and talk about the things that are on the horizon for us. Uh, why don't you go ahead and start it off, Jason? All right, fantastic. Well. 
I just launched my YouTube channel, Hero Journalism, last month, just a few weeks before Comic-Con, a couple weeks before. I've only got a couple videos up now. Most recently, I did a uh, eulogy for Joan Lee, Stan Lee's wife. Well done, by the way. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, in fact, I don't know if I had mentioned to you or maybe you saw me post it on Facebook, but um, uh, Stan and Joan's daughter, J.C. Lee, had sent me a message thanking me for, for the, the touching video. And that really, that right. really meant a lot. So cool. that was thrilling. And right now I'm uh, deep uh, trying to finish up my uh, exhaustive review of the Blade Runner 2049 Experience exhibit from Comic-Con. And uh, I've got a lot of stuff planned uh, for the channel coming up after that. Um, I'm going to be looking at, I'm going to be going through my tick video um you know one thing we didn't mention about the tick you know we skipped over it at the end there was that ending effect thing i mean i thought that was so cool or no i guess we did mention yeah, it mentioned i just, it, yeah. i thought that was so cool oh, so the rotoscope camera yeah yeah you did that right yeah yeah i loved it i loved it i thought that was totally cool so um i i think that was a really fun exhibit and and i get some footage of the the 20 foot tall antennas and such so I'm gonna put something together for that, but I have got uh, a lot of new uh, content that I'm getting ready for. I've got an X-Men, uh, the animated series from the 90s flashback coming up. I've got uh, some look at some other movies that are gonna be coming out in theaters later this year, um, such as uh, um, Murder on the Orient Express. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, looking forward to crank out some video. I've got a couple more Comic-Con related videos I'll be cranking out as well. So you'll be able to find those on HeroJournalism.com or Facebook slash HeroJournalism. Or you can find me at Twitter, Hero Journalism's on Twitter, at 4K. That's at the number 4, C-A-D-E-1. Cool. Well, before we go to Dan, um, you want to talk about your, uh, your other project that uh, is coming up soon? My, oh, oh <laughs> I totally, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I do uh, film uh, production in my spare time, uh, and I do some writing and some acting, and um, uh, one of my previous acting projects was really fun, and I've just uh, been notified that it's coming back, and and that they're bringing me back for the project as well. It's a, a stage theatrical production, Evil Dead the Musical. Um, you know, I guess it's becoming a lot more popular nowadays. People know about this. But when we first did it, our first run was we'd do a Halloween set of shows from uh, 2012 to 2014. So we did three Halloweens in a row. And... And back then, you had to kind of explain <laughs> what the hell it was to everybody. But, I mean, a lot of people don't, you know, especially if they're from a certain generation, they may not be aware of the film. Right. So uh, you got to explain that part. And then you have to explain, well, no, it's not really, uh, you know, because then I would tell someone, you know, about it. And they, oh, I, sorry, I'm not interested. I don't like horror movies. And then you're like... No, it's Evil Dead the musical. It's a comedy, you know, satire or you know of the of of the the material that it it's based on. So it's it's just a, a fantastic show to be involved in. It's it's funny as heck if you're uh, a genre or horror nerd. Um, it's it's you, you just got to go. I mean, I've never had a, a hardcore horror movie fan or just genre movie fan go that didn't you know come out of there. Uh, with a big grin on their face. I mean, it's it's really fun. It's a little bit of interactivity. Uh, there's a splatter zone. The first few rows of the splatter zone, <laughs> where uh, in fact it says uh, clearly in black and white on the program, if you sit in the splatter zone, you will get bloody. <laughs> if you sit somewhere else, you might get bloody. So, <laughs> well, when's that coming out? That is going to be coming out um, the uh, final uh, weekend. I think it's actually the final two weekends of... We, we, they just got the dates out, and so I don't okay. have them like, memorized yet. But I think it's the 19th or the 20th is the first show, and the final show is definitely that weekend right before Halloween. Halloween this year is on a Tuesday, I think. So our final show will probably be on the, the 28th or the 29th. So basically we do uh, Halloween weekend at the end of October. And, uh, and a lot of times we'll do the weekend prior to that as well. And that's at the 10th Avenue Theater here in uh, downtown San Diego. Cool. Uh, I think I was going to say, you know, we want to 
we'll, we'll check it out. But I think that's during uh, LA Comic Con. <laughs> you know, it is. It, it's funny that you say that because 20, I 29. was just starting to uh, get plans together for LA Comic Con, and I noticed those those conflicts. And I even thought, well, maybe I can just go for one day to LA Comic Con. Probably can't. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought maybe because con, uh, con starts what Thursday? Oh no, Friday. Friday. Oh, it's right. just Friday, Saturday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, I forget it. There's not, you know, I thought, well, maybe, maybe I could go up during the day Friday and come home for the Friday night perform. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's just not yeah. going to work out, probably. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they, right. <laughs> I didn't even think yeah, about no. that. Um, so yeah, uh, that bums me out. But uh, uh, so that's a little bit of a bummer. <laughs> and so you guys, I'm sure, will be busy that weekend. Right, uh, Dan. Um, Long Beach Comic Con in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I also have, like you guys, the Los Angeles, Stan Lee's Los Angeles Comic Con, <laughs> formerly Kamikaze. Right. I also have TwitchCon, which is the week before that, up in Long Beach. Um, Designer Con, which is mid-November. Yeah. Um, those ones are for sure. Possibly BlizzCon, possibly Rose City Comic Con in Portland, and possibly San Diego Film Fest. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I go to that every one, not every year, but I did go last year. Cool. Alex, what's uh, what's next for us? Um, just like Dan, a lot of similar ones. Long Beach Comic Con. Uh, is that Labor Day weekend? Second yes, it is Labor Day weekend. Because yeah. Labor Day is on a Monday. Okay. And yeah, Stan Lee's Los Angeles Comic Con on uh, Halloween weekend. Um, Design Con, November 11th and 12th. Uh, some maybes is Baltimore Comic Con, uh, September 22nd to 24th. And uh, maybe in two weeks, Comic Con Palm Springs might do that one. We'll see. Yeah, unfortunately, we won't be able to make uh, the Macross World. Uh, I think there's a conflict with uh, Stanley's LA Comic Con that mm. weekend. Yeah, we'll see. You got to <laughs> take a look at that. <laughs> um, I guess just to sort of add on to what other things Hall H will be doing in the near future. Um, I mentioned uh, uh, SDCC Fit. It's a big proponent of what we're we're doing as well. Um, I kind of want to see and sort of maybe pick um, SDCC Fit fans' brains a little bit on what we can do to sort of take it to the next level. Um, you know, I mean, I, I plans to sort of uh, make shirts. Uh, we can talk about uh, you know maybe having a formal meetup at, at some of the cons um, and maybe a. a you know, a separate website, and we can also talk about possible content. So if you have any ideas, uh, just hit me up on social media. Use the hashtag, you know, SDCCFIT, or shoot me a direct mail uh, on Twitter, Instagram, or our Facebook page, and let me know what you think. Cool. Um, and, Dan, where can people find you on, online? Um, you can find me all over. I sometimes contribute to the nerdelement.com to our friend Leonard Sotana, EnglishmanInSaneDiego.com, which if you don't feel like typing out, just type AEISD.com. Right. Um, that's where you can usually find me. Cool. And, uh, of course, you can find us at uh, HallAge.com, and we're all on the social media, on the interwebs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're Hall H, and then D-O-T-C-O-M. Um, and, uh, as I mentioned earlier, SDCC Fitch, look up the hashtag, and... Uh, you want to close this out, Alex? Um, when do you, art, do you do art? Oh, I'm sorry. Or? My bad. Shame <laughs> on me. <laughs> uh, art watch. Yes. Um, I guess you can go first, Alex. Um, I guess uh, since Comic Con is international, I'm going to push uh, from Russia, from Bubble Comics or Bubble Studios. They're the um, only Russian publisher that puts out monthly uh, original comic books. Uh, their bubble comics, and I picked up uh, trade paperback *Time of the Raven*, which has um, like an anthology of like all their characters of different um, comic public comics they publish, and put it all in one book. And the artist is uh, Anastasia Kim, and she was there at um, at Comic Con this year, so all the way from Russia. Cool, uh, Jason. I'm sorry? Do you have anybody for Artwatch? Oh, yeah, you're right. I, t and I do have one for Artwatch, because I didn't last time. Yeah, um, 
I stopped at the booth of Scott Haddix. In fact, I had that on it, on my phone to, to make sure I was uh, had it because it's he's, that last name was just. I wanted to make sure I had that right. Um, yeah, I had found him um, on. Actually, I found him through Dan Barry. Dan <laughs> Barry had posted on the Star Wars. Um, San Diego Star Wars Society page. Is that right? Do you ever post there on Facebook? I may have posted all over. Okay, yeah, right. You post everywhere. And I think that's what it was, was I'd gotten this this notification on Facebook that you had posted something. This is my recollection. I could be wrong. <laughs> uh, I clicked on it, which brought me to their Facebook page or whatever. And I scrolled down. I started noticing this this guy's art, Scott Haddix. And and then I and he mentioned he would be there at Comic Con and and I I stopped at his uh, booth and I really like his artwork. He's got this kind of series that he does, which are kind of like close ups of like you know kind of uh, it's just like like I don't know like like there's a, 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 a like kind of like how in a movie when they when they zoom in and they close up on your face from like your forehead down to your nose and it's just you know the intensity of that, you know, moment or whatever. He, he's got a, a series of his artwork that he does based on that. But he does a lot of other stuff. And I ended up picking up a couple prints of some of his stuff, uh, some of his Stormtrooper and, uh, and Boba Fett work. Um, I thought it was just really cool. Yeah, he had some of his stuff just looks very classic. Mm -hmm. And then some of it has a very modern feel, like the uh, Stormtrooper and Boba Fett stuff had... You know, kind of like um, a little bit more of a modern, almost psychedelic type of color schemes to him and everything. Or uh, how do you spell his name? Scott Haddix. H, H A T T, and I think it's O X. And I am just, you know, I've got him right here. Yeah. See, so look at there. I know you can't see this in the podcast, okay. but this is a just a, a piece of art that he did, which is just a uh, oh, uh, just a. Um, uh, a close-up of Vader, like I said, I, I kind of uh, makes me think of the uh, uh, a film, uh, an extreme close-up of a film when they zoom into the hero or to the villain's face, just right into their eyes, and you're you're thinking, oh my gosh, um, uh, just the intensity of it. And he does it through, it, it's kind of like a series he does through the H A T T O X. Did I say I X or O X? No, you got it. Right. I, I was having a hard time remembering it when I was looking for him at the con. But, um, I mean, he's just a really cool guy. I assume he must be local to San yeah, Diego. I forgot San to Diego. ask, but he's, it was the San Diego uh, Star Wars Society was how I got a hold of him. And they had a, uh, a table which you all walked by. It was, you know, those table. You know, when you're going to the back side, the fan, fan, oh, the fan table. Is that yeah. what they call that yeah. section, the fan tables mm -hmm. or whatever? Yeah. And you know, like the five hundred first legion yeah. and the five hundred first or on, whatever. Yeah. Is there? On, yeah, on the mezzanine, right? Right, right. Yeah. So you go down that first uh, escalator, and and they were like, they were one of the first people right in front of you without having to turn left or right or anything. Star Wars Society, and and then I saw him inside the show he um was uh, a partner with uh, uh uh someone else who's got a booth that 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 he does you know distributes his artwork or something i for and i'm forgetting what who they were off the top of my head but mm -hmm. really cool guy stopped talked to him uh you know just very uh, nice guy uh couldn't you know wait to you know answer questions or whatever talk about his artwork um, in fact, and he even may be, you know, contributing some artwork to hero journalism. I mean, he's just a, a really great guy. So, uh, I, and I love this stuff. Like I said, I picked up a couple prints. Nice. Um, yeah, really cool guy. Cool. Dan? I'm one artist that I got a commission from as part of my, uh, Sam and this, her, I may be mispronouncing your artist's name, Mako Fufu. Formerly, she was... Um, Argentine-born manga artist now this oh, in North wow. Carolina. Awesome. So I picked up a commission of um, Desire from the Endless and Sandman, which I'll send you guys a picture of later. Okay. And the, yeah, her art looks, I mean, it's manga style, but it's pretty cool looking. When I requested the commission from her, she was actually a fan of the Sandman and the Endless book, so she was more than happy to do it. Nice. Alex? 
Um, oh, yeah. oh, I did. Yeah, My bad. <laughs> and and the stage you came from Bubble Comics. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I, Get I, another I, mention in there. Nice work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess for me uh, this week, uh, I think I already had mentioned uh, Stefan Frank on a previous podcast. I think the one we did with uh, um, with the Not So Fresh podcast. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm going to talk about the other. Uh, uh, the other comic book that I mentioned earlier, Spencer and Locke, uh, it's written by um, David Propose, and the arts by uh, Jorge Santiago Jr., and colors by Jason Smith, and letters by Colin Bell. But um, I haven't had a chance to read it yet because uh, Alex had it. He was holding it for me just because I didn't have no space on my, my bag. So And he has a like, a like a box that he holds all his comic books in. So... Um, I just got it back uh, when we met up for this podcast, and I'm, I'm thumbing through it. And um, as I said earlier, Spencer and Locke, if you can imagine Calvin and Hobbes meets uh, Sin City. Um, like, I'm looking at the, the interior, the, the, the first part. I think when they do like sort of flashbacks, it looks sort of like Calvin and Hobbes' artwork, and then they go back and forth between, you know, uh, present day and the past, and then it gets more, you know, sort of... Uh, noirish, you know, so it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm looking forward to checking it out. And um, yeah, David was cool. Um, I'll post that podcast uh, uh, relatively soon. And yeah, Spencer and Luck, check it out. That'll be probably a cool TV show. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he didn't. He didn't mention that there's sort of uh, in talks. In talks to to get some sort of. That'd uh, be pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I did. You know, by the way, uh, say hi to the. Best dressed and most interestingly named man at Comic Con, Batten Lash. Oh yeah, you guys know him. <laughs> he was looking stylish. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he very fastidious every time. Every Exhibit time. Exhibit A Press. Pardon? Exhibit A Press. Is that? That's his company. Oh, I did not know that. I didn't yeah. remember that name. Yeah. Supernatural Law. Yeah, yeah. Wolf yeah. and Bird Supernatural Law. Yeah. yeah, him and his wife Jackie Estrada. Yeah. I. Uh, oh, I. Uh, I totally forgot that. That's. Jackie Estrada, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like I, I didn't... I have always uh, just been kind of fascinated with the guy, and and uh, and I've seen him at many cons, and like I, I believe that. He's the most oh, best-dressed yeah. best and dressed. most interestingly named did, man did, at Comic-Con. Did you get a chance to talk to him at the San Diego Comic Fest? No, I don't think I did. I have talked to him a couple times at con, including mm-hmm. uh, this one, but no, I don't think he, I did. Was he just there as a guest? or? Would... Uh, he was on a few panels. Yeah. Okay, okay. He, he was exhibiting also. That's what I was meant. Yeah. Was yeah. he also exhibiting? Okay. Yeah, he was. Maybe I might have then. I might have to go back. You know what? I think I recorded most of my, my uh, uh, floor walkthrough, so I'll have to check that out. Cool. Well, you know, I just want to thank all everybody for me on the show today. Um, it's uh, you know, San Diego Comic Con is a con that uh, you know it's a big it's a big deal for all, for a lot of people, especially for us. Uh, I, I enjoy going you know every year, and even more so as a content creator, you know, just second like different perspective, and and I love engaging with uh, other content creators and other you know uh, fans of you know the different genres. It's just I just love the whole engagement part and just getting other people's perspective. Yeah, it's pretty I, cool. I agree. It's it's just it's an experience. Yeah, for sure. Um, Alex, you want to close us out? Yeah. So we'd like to thank everyone for uh, joining us, and um, thank you to our listeners of the Hall H Show podcast. Our mission is to put the mainstream Hall H spotlight on some of our favorite pop culture and comic book ar- artists, writers, and uh, other creatives, uh, especially merging talent and the ones we think deserve more exposure. So please make it a point to visit Artist Alley at all the conventions you plan on going to this year. And if you're listening on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, we would appreciate a rating and, and a comment. And we're always looking for interesting guests to have on the show. So if you have any suggestions, please reach out to us on social media, media using hashtag Hall H Show. And once again, hashtag Hall H Show. Lastly, just because sending Comic Con is over doesn't mean you get to slack off on being SDC fit. That's right. Peace, cheers, and artists assemble. Artists assemble. Later, guys.